All right, so the harsh realities of entrepreneurship. It, it's, it's very simple. Biggest thing, biggest note to take on this, there will be challenges. Okay? There will be challenges. If you are an entrepreneur, there will be challenges. I call them challenges. Some people call them problems. Okay? One of the big things that we often hear is people say, well, it's just not fair, it's just not fair, it's just not fair. There's no such thing as fair. The world is not fair. It's not a fairy tale where there's always happy endings and everything goes the way it's supposed to go. It doesn't happen. It's not supposed to happen that way. In fact, one of the, when I think about this and I think about people telling me things that are not fair, I, I think about the, the, the one time in, in the Bible that peace on earth is mentioned. Right? Is when Jesus said, I did not come to bring peace to this earth. I came even though as long as you are here, there will be trials and tribulations. Right? So he's telling us there's, there, you're, there's not going to be any peace. Right? There's not going to be fairness all the time. The world is brutal. And the fact is, is that most people tend to underestimate how brutal the world really is. And that's why we have challenges that we have more often than not difficulties overcoming. Because we often, we often underestimate the fact of what it's going to take to take care of our families, what it's going to take to take care of ourselves. I know, you know, one of the things, um, Whitley, when she was getting ready to move out, she's like, I can take care of myself, Dad. I can take care of myself. I can do this. I, got, I, I can, you know, I don't have all this stuff and I don't have to worry about all this stuff and everything else. And then, and then she moved out. Okay, you're old enough to move out. Move out. Doesn't mean I don't love her, right? But she's old enough to move out. The thing is, is, is I give it about a month, right? And then I, I'm asking her, how's, how's he going? Dad, it's a lot harder than I thought it was going to be. Really? You think? Yeah. There's a lot of stuff that you just don't realize. You're welcome, okay? I tried to tell you. You didn't want to listen. It's that teenageritis thing, right? You're gonna move out on your own, start your own family, and get all this stuff going and everything else. Life is hard, right? Just like business, business is hard, okay? <clears throat> it doesn't have to be hard. The reality is, is that most of us make it much more difficult than what it needs to be. But there are those of us that we like to live in a world of fantasy endings, right? We want the happy, happy times and the fantasy. And, and I feel like social media has done us a big injustice on this anyway. Because everybody, pick, everybody puts their best foot forward on social media. You don't put pictures up of all the crap that you go through on a day-to-day -day basis, right? It's like me yesterday. I posted a, posted a little video. Piper started crawling, right? So, and, you know, I posted this little video of Piper crawling. I was all, all excited about Piper crawling and, and this. And the other. He posted that, and everybody looks at Oh, and the, all these likes and people, oh, how precious. Oh, how sweet. No, oh, how... What you didn't see was later that night, the fact that she was screaming because her gums hurt. We got zero sleep that night. In fact, we got zero sleep the night before that because her gums are hurting. She's trying to, trying to start cutting teeth. On top of that, she has allergies, the same thing that's going on with my voice. She's got allergies and that kind of stuff, so she's got trouble breathing. So nobody gets any sleep. But that little video, her crawling, is cute. Right? But a lot of times what happens on this social media mess is we tend to look at that and take that as a mental picture of what other people's lives are like. And they don't realize that, hey... The same baggage you have, somebody else has. If everybody has baggage, in fact, anybody that tells you they don't have baggage is a liar. That's their baggage, right? We all have mess to go through. We all have things that we have to deal with. And so in entrepreneurship, what we have to do is we have to understand a lot of the things that we will go through or we could go through and be able to offset those as best we can. In fact, if I know and, and can acknowledge issues before those issues come up, I can set myself up for success by attempting to set up systems and processes that help offset these. It's actually like a chess game. It's like a chess game, absolutely. 
So that's the thing is that I'm not anticipating the next move. I'm anticipating five moves forward. Right? And in business, that's, that's what we have to do. We have to think about, I don't just think about in business. I don't think about today. It's one of the things Kevin asked me from time to time. Why, why, why is your thought process this? Because I'm thinking five years from now. Not just today, but five years from now. Right? What do we got going on? And the reality of it is, is that most people have no goals. Most people have no goals. That is shocking and important enough that it's important for me to write that down. Most people have no goals. Most people that have goals don't have goals that are big enough. The point of this is, is that while the world is rough, while the world is unfair, while there's no such thing as fair, we have challenges, problems, and all that, you and you alone are in charge of your own destiny. Nobody else. See, one of the realities that we have to deal with is that we have to deal with the fact that we are in charge. Hmm. You can grow and succeed, but think about it this way. All growth requires challenge. <coughs> All growth requires challenge. One of the things you've heard me say in the past is no person has ever been successful on their own, right? <coughs> but the law of sacrifice says that there's no such thing as success without sacrifice. That means challenges are required. So think about that. In fact, I mean, you look like this sleeve on my arm, right? So my arm for because of overuse and I've overworked it, I'm, I've hurt it and all that kind of stuff. But I was thinking about it this morning as I was putting the sleeve on, right? And you think about think about working out. Something as simple as working out. You go and you start lifting weights to build muscle, right? How do you build muscle? Well, the way you build muscle is by lifting things heavier than you're used to lifting. And so what ultimately happens is you're taking the fibers of the muscle and you're separating them. You're literally tearing them apart, right? And so these fibers are separating, they're tearing apart. And then as it heals, it heals back thicker. That's how you grow muscle. So in order to get stronger, you have to tear down what you already have. In order to grow, you have to tear things apart. It requires challenges. It's about how people hit their lid, yeah. It's because, matter of fact, uh, people hit their lid because they, they, get, they start doing things that are going to stretch them past that point to where they start tearing things apart in a sense, right? And they reach that right at that edge of their comfort zone. Your comfort zone is a lid. Yeah. Boom. Then they stop. Boom. Then they stop. Boom. Then they stop. It drives me crazy because I oftentimes hear people say, well, you know, I could have. Yeah, I could have, should have, would have, but didn't. Well, you know, it hurt to do that. I didn't want to do that. I didn't want to give up my friends. I didn't want to give up this opportunity. I didn't want to give up on this. I didn't want Everything requires sacrifice. There's a price to pay for everything in life. That's a reality. Everything has a price. The question is not, does it have a price? The question is, are you willing to pay it? So let me give you 10 harsh realities of entrepreneurship real quick. Number one, success beyond meeting your basic needs requires hard work, dedication, and commitment. Success beyond meeting your basic needs requires hard work, dedication, and commitment. Number two, if you're going to be in successful in business, you're going to need lots of money. People say, David, money isn't everything. It is reasonably close to air. Okay. 
money may not be everything for us that have you know morals and values and all that kind of stuff and you know relationships are important and my faith is important and all that kind of stuff is important but here's the thing I can't eat my faith I can't sleep on it right I can't clothe my kids with my values and my morals right I use these things in what it is that I do, but faith requires action, right? And it's true for me, because as a Christian, I believe in, in the things that the Bible says, right? And one of the things the Bible says, faith, with, faith without works is dead. Huh. There's so many different verses that I quote that, that tell me all about this stuff, you know, Paul says, take a step closer to God and he'll take a step closer to you. That means I have to take action. Right? Even the beginning, when, when God commanded Adam and Eve, the rules, right? Go forth, be fruitful, multiply, subdue. Through that you shall take at dominion. I mean, the concept of taking dominion. Go forth, be fruitful, multiply, subdue. All those are actions. Right? But the thing is, is that actions cost money. Doing things costs money. Building a business costs money. Now, in fact, there are two things in life you can spend. You can spend time and you can spend money. Time is not money, but time is valuable similar to money. And the thing is, is that there's only so much time you can spend. In order to grow past that, you have to pay people with money to do other things for you. And need lots of money. Number two, life or number three, life is not fair and neither is business. That's reality. Don't expect it to be fair. Don't look for fair. Don't think about fair. I heard somebody somebody say one day, well, you know, we have to treat all people equally. We have to treat all people equally. We have to treat all... No, you don't either. You don't treat all people equally. You treat people fairly, but, but not equally. In fact, treating the fair to me, the concept of fair, in my opinion, <coughs> is I am doing things with the intent for win-win for whoever is involved. That's what's fair. It's all about the intent. The intent for win-win for people that are involved. That's the extent of fair. Number four, the world does not care whether you succeed or fail. The world doesn't care whether you succeed or fail. Because the reality of it is, is that though you have people in your life that care about you, the world as a whole doesn't. I'm not saying this to bring you down and to, oh, this is, oh, this is terrible. And, you know, I just want you to get reality. Right? The world doesn't care about you. Seven billion people on this planet. There are plenty of use. Right? There, no one is irreplaceable. That's reality. <clears throat> Number five, bad things happen to good people. There's another reality. You know, my dad lost his shop after 40 years. Lightning struck and burnt to the ground. He's a good person. A lot of bad things happen to good people. I firmly believe, again, my faith to me dictates that, that bad things happen to good people because of the fact that, there, that every testimony has to start with test. Right? That's why bad things happen to good people. Because there's some of that, that, that bad experience that that good person goes through, that good person can use that experience to help someone else. Testimony always starts a test. Right? Bad things happen to good people. Understand that. Bad things will happen to you when you get in business. Invariably. And eventually. Number six. Despite competition, despite the economy, despite any other issue you have, you are your biggest obstacle. 
You are your biggest obstacle. Doesn't matter what the economy is doing. Pivot. That's what business is all about. Uh, and, and I hear it. I hear it frequently in coaching businesses. Well, you know, the economy has just been terrible. And yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's like that's a valid excuse. So what you're saying is because the economy is bad, that's, that's an excuse for you to do absolutely nothing and have an excuse for why you're not taking care of your family. Really? Man up. Or woman up. No? No, it's no excuse. Pivot. You're the obstacle, not the economy. Not competitors. Right? Not any of that kind of stuff. You're the obstacle. Number seven, you are not owed anything. You do not deserve anything you have not earned. The world doesn't owe you anything. I don't care what your background, I don't care what your family history, I don't care any of that kind of stuff. None of that matters. I had a conversation with a, with a guy one day. He's like, well, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm owed reparations. I'm owed do why are you owed reparations? Because I'm black. He actually said because I'm African American. Like, Dude, have you ever been to Africa? No. How do you know you're African American? Well, I'm black. That doesn't always mean. Right? But it's, okay, we'll I'm not even get into this discussion, dude. I said, so are you saying I'm owed the same thing? Well, no, you're white. I said, but I'm of Irish descent. Well, what does that mean? Well, there are more Irish slaves than black slaves. I mean, they were actually slaves first. We were slaves before you were. Really? You don't, you don't, you don't read history? You don't, you don't know these things? There's not a race of people on this planet that hasn't been enslaved at one point or another? You didn't know that? You're not old Jack. You earned nothing. I don't go around saying that. You know, I can remember when I went to high school, I graduated. I had, I had high grades. It got, school was always easy for me. Straight A's. Easy. Didn't have to do anything. Rarely ever had to crack a book. Things just made sense to me, right? I'm not saying that to brag because some people have to study very, very hard. I respect those people, right? I just didn't have to do it. So here I am graduating in the top of my class and you know, we, we, it's time to look at college, right? Looking at colleges and looking, okay, what scholarships available and, and this, that, and the other and nothing. Why? I'm white, dude, to be honest. See, because when I went to school, there was a big push, you know, equal opportunity, right? So if you're black... <laughs> If you're black, you got scholarships because you're black. If you're a woman, you got scholarships from your because you're a woman, right? Minorities and all that kind of stuff. They give scholarships freely because you were people that you know. I'm here, right? In grades and that kind of stuff. People that are way down here are getting full rides to school, and I got no scholarships. I kind of lie on that. I did get. I was offered one scholarship. It was a $500 scholarship to a local community college. You know, worthless. Wouldn't even pay for one class. All right. Did I grow up? No. What did I do? Went to work. Paid for it. I owned my business by then anyway. Right. Scholarship's great. What about these academic scholarships? The thing was, was I didn't gripe about it and whine and complain about it and make a big stink over it and all that kind of stuff. Guess what? I didn't earn it. I didn't have it. It wasn't given to me. So what? Right? You're not owed anything, entitled to anything, or don't deserve anything until you earn that thing. Number eight, <clears throat> you don't get to do what you want to do first. You get to do what you have to do. It's one, of those, it's one of those interesting things in business because a lot of times we hear people in business say, well, you know, I went in business so I could have freedom. 
okay? Go into business because you can have freedom at some point. That's a good idea. Go into business because you can have freedom now, not a good idea, okay? Because you're not gonna have freedom now. See, the beauty of business is if you take care of the stuff you have to do, you get to do more of the stuff you want to do. However, conversely, if you don't take care of the things you have to do, you don't ever get to do the things you want to do. And when you start doing the things that you want to do, the things that you have to do pile up more and more and more. Number nine, harsh reality. Learn how to sell, no matter how much you hate it. Every business owner is a salesperson. Everyone. I love it because I get people all the time that will say, you know, David, I'm the business owner. I'm not a salesperson. Really? Is that why your business sucks? I mean, if you can't sell your own, if you can't sell yourself, if you can't sell your business, you might as well not even bother. Learn how to sell. I get frustrated at my people from time to time because I still sell better than all they do. Right? I'm the owner. I own multiple businesses. I don't really have to sell anymore, but I do. Right? I talk to people all the time. You know, hey, and then they'll tell me, well, I need this, or I want this, or I could use this, or what. Great. We get you hooked up. Right? But that's one of those things that I understand. Look, as long as I'm in business, I'm going to need to know how to sell. Because you never know what could happen. You never know what could happen to your sales people or your sales team if you got one. And by the way, you're going to have to sell until you get one. Right? Number 10, the last one, you will always work for someone. Always. I understand that. Because a lot of times people will give the excuse... Well, I'm not going into bi or I'm going into business, so I don't have to worry about working for somebody else. I want to work for myself. If you're married, you'll work for your wife and kids. You have customers, you work for them. Clients. You will always work for someone. What you do will always be for someone else, not just you. Understand that. Don't make it just about you. Make it about other people. Take care of others. Help them out. The more, you, the more you ingrain these things into you, the better off you're going to be ultimately. The easier it's going to be for you to understand. You know, like the, you need lots of money. I, it drives me crazy when I, I look at uh, small businesses and I see, okay, well, what's your marketing budget? Well, we don't have a marketing budget. Well, so what are you planning on doing to make more money? You're just hoping and praying? I mean... Are you closing your eyes and just saying, oh, 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 yes, there's no magic beans, right? No magic bullet. You're not going to find Aladdin's lamp, right? There's no random black bag of cash that's going to appear on the side of the interstate. Yeah. I mean, it just, it just is. You know, we have to know and understand these things. Because when we know and understand these things up front, then we can put, we can put our mindset right, and we can also put the systems and structures in place to make sure that we don't fall prey to these realities that we have to go through. Because these realities are things that can springboard us to success as opposed to allowing us to be the victims of our own failure. There will be challenges. That's reality. Uniqueness and value. You know, one of the things that, that we know as business owner, undoubtedly we've heard the statistics about business failure rates and, you know, the fact that um, realistically less than 50% of businesses make it through the first couple of years and, and so on and so forth. And while there's lots of reasons for that, one of the big reasons for that is lack of differentiation. Let me write that down. Lack of differentiation. What do I mean by lack of differentiation? Everyone's kind of the same, so everybody's going to point to choose you over any other guys out there. Absolutely. The, the thought process um, in this is that lots of businesses effectively... and. And I think in many cases it's unwittingly turned themselves, in a sense, into a commodity, right? 
Take pizza parlors, for example. Most pizza parlors are the same. You go in, if it's a, a dine-in place, the, the main differentiation is whether they serve beer or not, right? They serve the same pizza. You can get a pepperoni pizza, a cheese pizza, a supreme pizza. You, you know, they serve the same kind of stuff. The doughs and things are very similar. There, there's minor differences, but there's no huge differentiation between them. I mean, one restaurant that attempts, a pizza parlor that attempts to do things quite differently is like CeCe's Pizza, right? Because unlike most pizza joints, they are actually a buffet by their nature. You have some that will offer a buffet for lunch, like Pizza Hut, but they don't do it outside of, outside of those regular hours. It's not an all-the-time thing. So CeCe's Pizza attempts to differentiate with... Uh, they make smaller pizzas, they make the buffet, they do, um, they do have those stinking cinnamon rolls that are amazing. Um, so they attempt to differentiate themselves in that way, but even still, they're very much the same in large part as everybody else. You go, when you go in to CeCe's Pizza, even if you're getting the buffet, what do you see on the buffet? Same pizzas everybody else serves, right? Same style. So utilizing this thought process, the question is not, you know, what are we doing that, that everybody else is doing? It's what are we doing differently from everyone else? It's that lack of differentiation that is oftentimes the difference between you being the sea of sameness and you standing out from the crowd. Matter of fact, one of the things that, as a business coach for many, many years, one of the things for me that I look at when I'm talking to somebody about their business is they say, they will often say, well, we specialize in all kinds of, right? So that makes it very hard to know why to choose the company. It's that whole all kinds of thought process, right? I mean, let me give you a prime example. One of my companies is an insurance brokerage, right? And so they, they deal with auto and home and business insurance and those types of things. They don't do much in the way of life and health and all that, but they, they can offer it if somebody asks for it. Now, it's an insurance brokerage. Now, insurance, insurance agencies are a dime a dozen, right? So you can find them everywhere. State Farm, Alpha, Allstate, Farmers, they're everywhere. Right? It's about like churches in the South, okay? Every street corner. So the question becomes, how do you differentiate? Matter of fact, when starting that particular business, that was my first question, is how do we differentiate between everyone else, right? So interestingly enough, we do something virtually no one else does, okay? And in that particular business, what we do, or I say what we do, I don't do anything with it, they do it. What they do, I'll be more accurate so I don't offend them, um, what they do is they actually market to other insurance agencies, right? Remember, agencies are a dime a dozen. So you say, well, wait a minute, why is it if I have an insurance agency and my job as an insurance agency is to sell people auto and home and business insurance and all that, why would I send people to you? Well, it's very simple. State Farm on average can only write four to five people, four to five um, out of every 10 people that walk in the door, okay? They have their target markets. They're the things that State Farm doesn't like. Travelers is the same. Hartford is the same. Um, Farmers and Alpha and Allstate, all of the guy code, they're all the same, right? There is that percentage of the population that they can't do anything for. It doesn't fit within their guidelines, right? So our marketing plan in that is to write everybody that falls outside of their guidelines. And so with that being the case, 95% of our business comes from what most people would consider a competitor. We get phone calls every single day from competitors sending us business, right? That's differentiation, okay? So when we look at this, yes, sir? What's it do for the other business to send you very people? Well, it's, fair, it's a great question. So here's the deal. If, if I want to look good as a company, I need to be a company that can help people out, right? 
And so there's reputation in that. If somebody comes to me and I just look at you and, ah, yeah, there's nothing I can do for you. See you later. How does that make, how does it make that person feel about you? Negative. Negative, right? So in a day and age where it's very easy for people to post negative stuff online, it's very easy for somebody to hop on Facebook or Google or whatever. Man, I walked in the door, tried to get insurance. They told me they couldn't do nothing for me. One star review, right? So there's one reason. The second, and, and by the way, flip that token. If you walk in the door and they say, well, you know what, we're not able to help you, but let's call these guys over here because if we can't do it, they can take care of you. Now what are you? You're a console. You're a solutions provider, right? So even though you couldn't do it yourself, you're connecting them, right? It's that networking aspect of it. You're connecting them with the people that can, okay? But the second, second factor of that, let's say, for example, you have your homeowner's insurance with XYZ State Farm, Okay. Now you go into State Farm and you say, okay, I need to get my car insurance with you guys. And for whatever reason, maybe you got some tickets or some wrecks or whatever, for whatever reason, State Farm says, we can't write this. You go to another company out there, they'll write the car insurance, but what's their next, what's their next target? Your homeowner's insurance. They're going to market to that homeowner's insurance, right? So our, in our marketing, what we're doing is we're talking to them about how we protect their book of business, right? So if you send them to us, you tell them, tell us that, hey, they have their home here, we will write their auto and we will put a note in the system not to market home, right? And we will put where they came from so that way we will know. So anytime that person talks to us about homeowner's insurance, then we can refer them back to where their homeowners is, right? They're by helping protect that book of business, helping protect the revenue of that organization, right? So we're keeping them from actually losing business by doing that. And then it also gives us that capacity then to help upsell other products and services that maybe we don't want to offer that the state farms or these other agencies do offer, right? And so we can offer that service and therefore help them make more revenue right? And so by doing so, it gives us, it gives us that trusted advisor approach, uh, as well as helping protect their book of business approach. I mean, we've, we've had, we've had um, these agencies, some of these agencies, and there are lots of them, by the way, some of these agencies have, have been sending us business regularly for as much as 10 years or more, okay? So, you know, you think you get a phone call, yeah, I mean, imagine if, if you're an agency, the average agency, by the way, will write one to two new business policies a week, right? But on average, the agencies that send us business send us one to two a week. And currently, I think Lauren said there are 68 of them, okay, that we have relationships with, all right? So you can imagine what that can look like right, in volume as that, as that continues to grow and increase and, and so on and so forth. So, but it's different. It's a completely different thought process than what most people look at. Because even most of your independent brokerages or independent agencies, most of them, again, look at all of these guys as competitors. And so therefore, they don't want to do anything with them. They want to avoid them like the plague. Whereas our strategy is to utilize that same thought process as a way to build and grow the business. And we also have training opportunities and those kind of things that we can actually utilize for their staff. So we have sales training and everything else that we can do to help their staff sell more, help them prospect better, help them generate more leads, because our marketing agency can do that, right? So now think about this, it's not all selfless. If I've got a state farm out here who's paying our marketing agency to generate leads and they're sending us all the referrals of all the people they can't write, then what's happening? You're getting paid for helping them be able to sell and you're getting more referrals. Yeah, so effectively we're getting paid for marketing as for our own marketing as opposed to having to pay for our own marketing. 
See how that works? It's just a completely different thought process, right? I know somebody's going to watch this video and say, that's genius, I want to copy that. You can't, it's copyrighted, right? I'm just saying. So what happens is if you want to excel in business, you have to stand out from the crowd. You know, you look at the idea of Entrepreneur University. It's completely different than, than every other strategy that's out there. Right? How we teach is different. What we do is different. We don't do a lot of the standard things that you'd find in a college or university. Right? The entire thought process is different. How we market it is different. Right? And so through all of that, then what happens is, is the, the, the point there is to differentiate to the point that we can highly target what we're looking for but also then offer a different experience than what other people are offering. Make sense? So the question becomes then, how do we stand out? How to stand out. There are several things that we can do to stand out in any business. The first is Excel at customer service. Sadly today, customer service is one of those things that many businesses pay lip service to, but they don't really do it. They want to talk about it. Oh, we provide great service. In fact, as a, a, again, back to the business coaching idea, it's one of the big things. When I ask, how, do you, how are you different from everybody else? We provide great service. Everybody says that. I can count on one hand in 26 years the number of times that people have not said we provide amazing customer service. And then when you talk to some of their customers, their customers are like, that's crap. Right? I've had that several times. Wow, really? If you provide that great a customer service, then why are there 47 negative reviews of you online talking about how your service is junk? Okay. You gotta provide good customer service. In other words, treat, treat your customers like they're royalty in whatever ways that you can. Provide value added, right? It doesn't matter, e even if you're not in the service industry, right? If you're a product provider, again, excellent customer service is an amazing thing. And I, I, you know, I know about customer service. Matter of fact, before we started this class, Several days ago, I, I figured I finally got a notification. Our alarm company, because we have multiple video cameras in the, our buildings, and so our alarm company, I got a notification saying that none of the video cameras were working. Crap. So I called the alarm company and I said, you know, hey, I got a notification. None of our video cameras are working. And so the, the lady's like, hold on, let me check, da 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 And she said, okay, it looks like you bought, your, um, you bought your stuff at a local provider, so we're gonna have to try to get in contact with a local provider, and, and when we get in contact with a local provider, we'll see if they can call you to schedule a time to come out and take a look at it. And I'm like, okay, I, I, can, I can kind of understand that, right? And so yesterday, the guy comes out, and is checking the video cameras. And he's like, well, I need to get into your account. You work for the company, why can you not get into my account without my username and password? Why is that, why as a service tech, why can you not get in here to reset my video cameras without a username and password? This actually took about five hours for him to fix this thing. And during this time, he's asking for a Wi-Fi password, right? I get it. Our system is Wi-Fi enabled. So, again, it can work over Wi-Fi or not. So, he gets the Wi-Fi password, and we have a Wi-Fi set up specifically for that kind of stuff. So, again, security reasons. So, he gets the Wi-Fi password. It's not working. It's not working. It's not working. Now, I worked from home yesterday. And so in the midst of my phone calls that I was making, I'm getting umpteen phone calls from the office here because the guy can't figure out his stuff. 
and then I'm getting you know messages through Slack and, and all this kind of stuff. I'm like, dude, I'm, tr I'm trying to actually get some stuff done. The whole reason I'm paying somebody to do this for me, if I was going to troubleshoot it myself, I wouldn't be paying a monitoring company. I would just go to Sam's and buy one of those multi-unit video camera systems, monitor it my dagum self, you know? So I'm getting very frustrated with this dude. And, and he gets everything. And, and I, matter of fact, it was to the point where Lauren called yesterday and said, hey, he's, he's still not got it fixed. What about... I was, I'm not paying these people for me to do their job for them. If he can't do his job, he needs to go on and send somebody out here who can get it done. Right? Talking about customer service. Okay? And so the guy ends up saying, well, everything is fixed and leaves. And this morning, I started getting text messages, right? The system, he had set the system to text me a video of any time because our, our cameras are all motion sensor activated and they're not supposed to be motion sensor activated whenever the, end, you know, whenever the system's disarmed, right? We're here when it's disarmed. There's no need. They do do constant recording, uh, but they're also most sensor activated for alarm purposes. So he had actually set it, and he had set it so it texts me and Kevin a video every single time. And he had set the setting on the camera so tight that leaves blowing outside were setting it off. So all day long, Kevin and I have been getting video text messages with the camera going off every couple of minutes. You know, talk about frustrating, right? And so I went, I, I told Kevin, I said, we're going to log in to the, and see if we can disable these notifications, whatever. Come to find out, he didn't fix all of the cameras. He only fixed one. So out of all of our cameras, only one actually works. So I had to call the service center back for them to tell me we're gonna have to send. We're gonna have to message somebody in the local market. That's the local dealer. That, and we're gonna have to see if we because we don't have access to their schedules and see if we can get somebody to come and fix this stuff. So my security's down apparently for a, two weeks before I even got a notification that the cameras weren't working. Now you're telling me it's days waiting on somebody to call me for an appointment. He messes it up. Now it's day gonna be days again before somebody calls me for an appointment. So much for security, right? That is not excelling at customer service. Okay? That is not excelling at customer service. When surveyed around 75% of customers, um, when surveyed around 75% of customers um, will state that they consider customer service the true test of a company's competence. 75% say it's the true test of a company's competence. You must excel at that. And the thing is, is you know, even these companies that, that they want to talk about, it, we offer great service, we offer great service. This great service is not something that as a company we should pay lip service to. It's something that we should do and let other people pay lip service about. Make sense? So that means do it. Let them talk about it. You don't talk about it. Right? Number two. You want to admit mistakes. Okay? And fix problems. Admit mistakes and fix problems. And again, the purpose here is to build and foster relationships. I can't tell you the number of times people will, people will not admit that they made a mistake or not want to fix a problem, right? And again, customers will equate an experience with a brand. Probably the, probably the best example I have of this right now is McDonald's. Think about it. The one thing that McDonald's is known for above everything else is very poor customer service. The only saving grace they have is they're on every street corner and every kid under the age of seven loves them because they sell chicken nuggets and put a toy in a box. Right? So it's the, it's the 
kids that are pestering mom and dad constantly. I know I've been through it for years. Pester mom and dad constantly. Can we go to McDonald's? Can we go to McDonald's? And that's part of their marketing plan. Put a play place in there, throw a toy in a box, put some crappy nuggets in the box. Kids eat the crappy nuggets, but they want the toy. They want to play in the play place. So therefore we go to McDonald's. Wow. Yet you can trust that nine times out of ten you get an order from McDonald's is going to be wrong lately. Right? In fact, I have had in the last three years, I have had significantly more wrong orders than right orders. To the point of you have to actually stop. If you're going through the drive through you wait and you check your bag. I don't care how much somebody's honking at you behind you. You check your bag before you ever drive away. Right? That's not an experience. But that's a mistake. And so you look at admitting mistakes and fixing problems. And again, I mentioned, I mentioned this not too long ago. But I went through the drive through at McDonald's because the kids wanted McDonald's. And I go and check my bag. And I have food missing. So I walk in the door. Hey, there's food missing. I've got, I've got a, a quarter pounder missing out of my bag. And the lady in the, black, and the, lady in the back pitches a fit. Not realizing that I actually came in. She's pitching a fit, calling me a liar and everything else. Loud enough so that all the customers in the restaurant could hear. There stands a manager. Manager says nothing. Right? That's a problem. That's a problem that drives away customers. And I'll tell you this, that, that happened two months ago. I haven't been back. Neither has anyone that I've talked to about it. Cost business. Customers equate experience with brands. When they have an experience and there's a mistake or there's a problem, they're, ex they're equating that with your brand. How you fix it and whether you take ownership of it will ultimately affect their concept of a relationship with you. And you have to be at the top of your game at all times to improve customer service. You have to improve that experience that they're going to have. Because however that experience comes from you is going to ultimately end up pushing them to what you do, how you do, how quality you are, right? I know we have somebody that comes and cleans our offices. It's actually a client. And she's um, very particular about how they do their work, right? And so the last time they came, last week, they came. And I got finished. And in my office, in my office upstairs, I have my own private bathroom. And so there's a hallway um, in, from my office to the bathroom, a little small area. There's a coat closet and all that. And, and we've been doing some construction in the bathroom, actually uh, redoing plumbing and all that because I have a shower in my private bathroom. And so we were redoing plumbing, installing a new hot water heater and cutting some drywall and doing some of that kind of stuff. So there's drywall dust all over the floor. But what had happened was um, one of the girls, one of the maids, had actually swept all the drywall dust out of the bathroom into my little carpeted hallway area. But they didn't bother to vacuum it up. Oops. It's a mistake. So I took a picture and, of it and texted it over to her. And, of course, she called me immediately. Um, you know, I'm so sorry, and you know, I'll we'll, we'll take somebody off a job and have them come and fix it. And this and that. now, now we have a really good working relationship, and so I told her, I said, "Don't worry, it's it's not something that anybody else sees really, but me or Kevin." And so they can just you know make sure they grab it next time they come because I don't want to track it everywhere and, and so on and so forth. So, I mean, that, that's one of those things. But you know, that owning up to that mistake and making it right, the effort to make it right, is super important number three be honest about your products and services be honest about your products and services 
By the way, honesty is not just the best policy. It should be the main policy. If you can't do something, don't tell somebody you can. If you can't bake that cake in 24 hours like they want, then you need to let them know, look, there's no way I can get this done in 24 hours. Don't, don't take the job and just let it be late. If your product or service doesn't work a particular way, then don't tell people it does. This stuff happens all the time. If honesty was the best policy, honesty was the main policy, roughly 75% of all the as seen on TV products would never hit stores. Because the vast majority of them don't work as advertised. And we see it all along, all the time. People will say something does one thing and it, and it doesn't realistically do that. I have many times over the years purchased something, whether it be a product or a service, that, um, that somebody told me it would work one way and it didn't. Matter of fact, I just, one of the softwares that we have that we spend a little over $1,000 a month on, I found out not long ago, and, and by the way, it was $11,000 to get in initially. That was the deposit for the software, non-refundable. But the sales guy told us it would do one thing, and it doesn't at all. They're working on that in a future update, but we need it now. So he paid all this money for this functionality that doesn't exist yet. Right? Lying to customers is the equivalent of shooting yourself in the foot. By the way, one consistent form of, of dishonesty in companies that I see is the failure to report bad news. The failure to report bad news. I was watching a TV show <coughs> last night. It was a, the, I forget what the name, a tanked, I think is what the name of it is, where they build the great big huge aquariums and, and this, that, and the other. And they were building an aquarium, I think it was in, I don't remember where it was, but it was for a basketball player um, for his house, right? And the um, glass, it's not really glass, but the the acrylic that they used for the aquarium actually cracked in transport, right? They had promised this guy that they would get it done by a particular day and time. Now, it cracked in transport, and we say, okay, well, that's not, that's not under our control. Obviously, a shipping company is going to ship it over there if they bust something, whatever, um, but they had promised that they were going to deliver at a particular date and time. Now they had to deliver the bad news, right? And they did, of course, which is great. But the thing about it is, is when you look at those kind of things, how many times do we see companies that something happens and, and they just don't say anything? Matter of fact, I got a notification. I had made an order the other day. And it's supposed to be delivered by UPS, Right? And so pop up, we get a notification pop up saying that delivery was attempted, but they don't live there anymore. In other words, it was delivered to the business. So it's a business delivery, not a residential delivery. The business doesn't live somewhere anyway. I mean, it's okay. No longer at this address, I guess would be a better description of that. But the, it said don't live there anymore. And I'm, what are you talking about? We get packages just about every single day. So why is this? And so, you know, I get on the phone with, with UPS and the lady's like, well, you know, they'll just try to, they'll, if, if it was a mistake, they'll try to re-deliver it later. No, I, I mean, I, I want to know why you're lying to me. D did the guy just not bother to deliver it? it was he just too busy and, and you know, figures, well, I'll just take these packages and deliver them some other day. You know? I mean, you pay for second day shipping on this stuff. You expect it on the second day. <clears throat> It'd be different if they weren't charging more for those services, right? And so come to find out, uh, because the lady finally gets on the phone with the driver, and the guy was like, yeah, I was across the street, and somebody across the street 
got the package because they said they were from across the street. So wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. You gave my package <coughs> to someone who is not me that just happened to walk up to your truck and say that they, they work for me that's not at my location because you weren't at my location, you were across the street, <coughs> and you just gave this package away. Yeah? Ma'am, I don't know what's going on, but your driver has got some issues and that need to be fixed, right? <coughs> now come to find out, they actually did give the package, he did give the package to Larry. Larry, for whatever reason, was going across the street to visit one of our customers. And so he was over there anyway, saw the UPS guy and said, hey, do y'all have any packages for us? But instead of the UPS guy scanning it and saying, to say it was delivered, he scanned it to, the, with the wrong code to say that it wasn't at this address anymore. So all along, the package is actually at our location. I'm yelling at UPS about this whole mess. The package is at our location, right? Larry never said anything about it. I'm on the phone with UPS yelling at them and and all that kind of stuff because I wanted my package, right? Talk about being honest, right? <clears throat> it actually took two hours. It took two hours for them to get the driver to say what actually happened. And the reason for that was because of the simple fact that he wasn't supposed to have let any dropped off a package at the wrong address, even if it was for someone else. Right? So being honest about the products and services. Number four is come up with something new. You know, emerging technologies, um, introducing new processes, new products, new services, those kinds of things. You know, what's old that can be made new? Fairly simple idea. But, you know, there's tons and tons and tons of examples. We won't go through them today, but there's tons and tons and tons of examples about businesses that have, have done something with old stuff and made it a completely new concept. And that's true in virtually any business. Some of the concepts that we've come up with over the years for the businesses that we've worked with have been revolutionary in their particular industry just because it's something that nobody else is doing. Number five, focus on a narrow niche. You know, the average family practitioner um, doctor in the United States makes around $130,000 a year. The average oncologist is around $500,000 a year. <coughs> the oncologist has the skill set to do everything the family doctor can do but chooses not to, right? So the key here is, is that thought process of by, by narrowing down my target market, I'm actually increasing my profitability, which is counterintuitive in most parts because it seems like the more products and services that I can offer, the more profitable I can be, the more I can try to sell to somebody. But the reality of it is, is you can't market everything to everybody. Unless you're Walmart and have billion dollar marketing budgets. Most businesses don't. Therefore, you really can't do that. So focusing on a narrow niche. When you try to serve everyone all at once, you end up serving no one because nobody really knows what you do. Being something to somebody is much better than being everything to nobody. Number six, create... A powerful offer or guarantee. Obviously, guarantees are a great way to reduce perceived risk of, of buying a product or service. Uh, but you know, you look at the offers and things that you can get or things that you can do or things that you can give. I mean, it's, it's tremendous. It, sometimes they, it can be something like a, a, a law firm that guarantees that you'll be called back within 24 hours, right? So that could be a huge thing, right? I know, uh, matter of fact, one of the, one in, in our uh, tax and accounting firm that we own, 
we actually do business with a particular company that is the most expensive in their market. They're by far the most expensive in their market. And we do business with them yearly. The reason why we do business with them yearly is because they guarantee if we need service, someone will, a, a live human will answer the phone within 15 seconds. No automated systems, no dialing and, and waiting, none of that kind of stuff. A live human, guaranteed, a live human will answer the phone within 15 seconds. They have never let us down on that. It is worth the money, and they pay the extra staff to make sure that it happens, but it is well worth the money because when, when those guys have a need, they need it now. They don't need to have to wait for somebody to call them back or sit on hold for 20 minutes or an hour or anything like that. You get used to that with the IRS. You don't want to have to deal with that with the, your vendors, right? So, you, and you can do quite a few different things. You're not limited on these powerful offers or guarantees. I mean, it can be as simple as, uh, uh, in, in a couple of weeks, we're going up to um, Gatlinburg Pigeon Forge area. Love that area. It's beautiful, smoky mountains and and so on and so forth and we're staying at the wilderness at the Smokies and the kids are all excited and everything else which is great one of the things that stands out in my mind though every time I go up that direction is you get up into Gatlinburg and all that area they have the fudge shops you know you think about it, it's the fudge shops you ever been up that area no you need to go at some point but they have these fudge shops and so they make they make this fresh fudge right and so it smells delicious and, and, and all that. And the one thing that they do, though, is you go up, you can taste any of it you want to taste. They give free samples, right? Just the idea of hearing the words free sample almost makes me drool thinking about it because I, I, do, I don't like to eat lots of sweets, but I do enjoy a little bite every now and then. More often than not, I'm the guy that can taste two or three samples and I'm good to go. I don't have to buy any. But everybody else in the family is like, hey, you know, hey, we need to get a half pound of this and a half pound of this and a half pound of this. Everybody wants their own block, right? But that's what they're, that's what they're doing. That power, that's a powerful offer, right? It's like a barbecue joint. You know, the, the worst thing you can have in a barbecue joint is, is a really good ventilation system, right? One that gets rid of all the smell. Yeah. You want that smell. Matter of fact, not only do you want the smell inside the restaurant because it makes you hungrier, you want, that, you want the smoke coming out the top and you want the smell all around. So if your restaurant's in the middle of a shopping center parking lot, people are smelling that cooking while they're in the shopping center and they, they're thinking that's a powerful offer, right? There's nothing like smelling a steakhouse or a barbecue joint or something like that when you're getting a little hungry. Oh yeah, we're going to go over here and eat because I'm starving, right? Powerful offer. So powerful offers don't always have to be, you know, that how you do what you do. It doesn't have to be money back guarantees. It doesn't have to be those kinds of things, right? Any powerful offer or guarantee. We had a client um, a number of years ago, about five or six years ago. It's a Mexican restaurant, right? And so... You know, one of, the, one of the things they said is, they said, you know, we need to increase our profitability. And I said, okay, well, it's not that hard to do. You know, t tell me what some of your most profitable items are. Oddly enough, you know, one of, the, uh, one of the most profitable items in their restaurant was fajitas. Okay? I mean, there's not really that much to fajitas, if you think about it. Right? So, what we did is I said, okay, here's what you're going to do. Just before, during, and after every rush time that you have, I want you to cook a fresh steaming plate of fajitas, right? And all I want is I want one of your servers or someone to carry it throughout the restaurant, circle all the way throughout the restaurant, and just walk right back into the, walk right back into the kitchen. Like they were going to deliver it to somebody, but didn't. He said, why? Think about it. Right? Think about it. 
Fajitas. You hear the word fajitas, what's the first thought process that comes to your mind? Probably the steaming hot plate. With all the... Steaming hot plate, right? The, the sizzle, right? We hear it before it even comes to us. I mean, you, you, most of the time you hear it. They come out of the kitchen. It doesn't matter really where you are in the restaurant. You hear that. <laughs> right? Oh, somebody's getting fajitas. And then you see the steam coming off the plate. It's always steam coming off the plate. If there's no steam coming off the fajita plate, you need to change your process. Right? <laughs> it means you ain't cooking that food right. Okay, it's cold. Stop it. Okay? The steam. And then the smell. You smell and fajitas smell good. Okay. But fajitas are one of the most expensive things on a Mexican menu and also one of the, the highest profit items. And so what this did is it actually increased their fajita sales by 136%. Yeah. So to this day, they still do it. Every 15 minutes, they'll take a steaming plate of fajitas out there and it's made a huge impact, right? That's a powerful offer. You're putting it right in front of somebody. It's the same concept as the barbecue restaurant or the steakhouse or whatever. Number seven, create a memorable culture. Create a memorable culture. You know, creating a good culture within your organization is not only a, a HR retention tool, it can also be a great customer tool as well. And so you, you think about that. What do you do within your organization that makes people want to come there? Right? And that's the key. And we've done lots of things over the years. We stopped doing some of the things that we're doing since we moved into the new building, but we're actually in the process of, of reinventing some of those things. Do you know, for years, one of the things that, that we've always done is we've always had a little internet cafe, in a sense, set up for clients. So if any of our clients needed to come in and use the internet, use a computer, print something out or whatever they could, and we've always had work, uh, little stations set up for them. We actually have an office for that right now, right? And so... You know, you, you look at that, it's just something simple. Um, we've had, uh, in the insurance brokerage, the insurance brokerage has had key tags for years, right? I think those little membership key tags, but it's not the little barcode type deal and everything else. It's a, if lost, please call, right? And it has a number on there. I can't tell you the number of times that the girls have had to field phone calls, we found some keys. I can remember uh, a few years ago, we, had a, we actually had a guy that got mugged. It was a client that got mugged um, behind a movie theater in Mountain Brook, oddly enough. And so the guy got mugged and they dropped his keys and his wallet and his cell phone actually behind the theater and somebody else found it. And they called us, right? So we called the client. We had another one that the guy was in J.C. Penney. He didn't even know he'd lost his keys. Hey, we found your keys. They're at customer service, Right? just a different thought process in the customer service realm but it's also that that different culture about you know what are how are we taking care of people what are we doing to provide right something that we did done historically um, we haven't in the last two years because of uh, uh, construction and, and everything else we've had going on but historically we've always had a, a Christmas party right we'll start that Larry's got that on his docket for next year so we've always done a charity Christmas party. Years and years and years we've done this charity Christmas party where we'll invite all clients and the general public can come to and we'll adopt a local charity that is underfunded. It's always one that's underfunded. So we'll adopt a local charity that's underfunded. And so we'll get restaurants and things to sponsor and people that bake and that kind of stuff to sponsor. And we'll have them bake things. And then everybody that comes gets to eat. And we usually have music. Sometimes it's live music. Um, we usually have that kind of stuff and I have it just to where people can come and have a good time and they donate to the charity right so uh, a few years ago we did backpack buddies right backpack buddies they do feeding the children who are the underprivileged children and that kind of stuff actually putting food in their backpacks for latchkey kids and, and those things so they can actually eat um, 
And so it's a neat little charity, completely underfunded, but, but great charity that, that really touched me well. And so we actually got a list from Backpack Buddies of the things that they needed in that to uh, put in the backpacks, right? And so we had everybody bring all of that stuff. And then we got different local businesses to donate prizes and gifts and donate all this. And so we had raffles for all that. So you bring in stuff, then you got entered into the raffle, right? The employees love it. We also do, you know, we do a um, Christmas party every year for our staff. That's a memorable culture thing, too. We do invite some of our high-value clients as well, um, but we do a Christmas party. We'll do Dirty Santa, and, you know, we do that, and I get Christmas gifts for all the staffs and, and staff, and we usually do a potluck um, meal. Everybody brings something. I always bring the meat. We do the same thing at Thanksgiving. Um, you know, it's these, it's these different things that you can do within that culture. One of the things that we've always wanted is we've always wanted our clients to feel like family. So we treat them like family, right? There is no, you know, hey, Mr. So-and-so or hey, Mrs. So-and-so. I mean, I don't look at my mother and say, hey, Mrs. Hall. No. Hey, Ma. You know? We treat our clients the same way. We want them to feel like family, but we also want them to feel vested, right? That's a culture thing. That's what we want. Number eight, I kind of already talked about, but create a cause marketing effort. For us, for example, our, our charity Christmas party has never been with the idea or intent to generate any business for us. It has been specifically done to try to help those um, local causes that are underfunded. You know? What do you stand for? How do you give back to the community? People watch. People watch. So essentially, it's this idea of creating a partnership or a relationship with some sort of charity, right? To promote a cause. Now, we have always chosen to do locally, local underfunded. Um, the only charity that we contribute to on a regular basis that's not local and underfunded is actually the Shriners. Um, we do a lot for the Shriners uh, because of the burn hospitals and so on and so forth. Okay, I was actually a patient there when I was a baby. So they saved my life twice. Since they did, I support, right? So that's a, that's a huge thing for me. We have a business Amazon account, by the way. Um, as a side, this is a side note for this. Um, and if you didn't know, you can go to smile.amazon.com. You ever heard of this? Smile.amazon.com. It's like the, it's the same Amazon website, but what happens is when you sign in with your account, you can choose a charity, and one percent of everything you spend on Amazon <coughs> actually gets donated to that charity. As a business, we spend a lot of money. And we do a lot of shopping with Amazon because it keeps us from having to go to Sam's and Walmart and all that. So, you know, we have charity, the charities that we support through that particular thing too. Um, have a cause. Number nine, become a social business. Become a social business. Now, the idea of this social business is not, not like um, doing social media. That's not what I'm talking about. It's kind of like you've seen some of these uh, brands out here. Um, I, I've noticed it recently with a, a shoe brand. I'm trying to remember the name of that particular shoe brand. Um, the idea of it, it I think it's Tom's. But they do a one-for-one. One. So every time somebody buys a pair of Toms, they actually will then um, donate a pair of Toms. And, and so they give it to people in need. So your cause marketing is extended in this social arena. And we've done plenty of this. We've actually done a lot of this uh, over the years. Businesses that are struggling, that have no capacity for funding, but they're doing a really good thing. We work with a lot of nonprofits and those kind of things that, that there's no way they could afford to pay us. Um, so we'll provide for them and take care of them and, 
and help with whatever we can help with to help um, help their cause. Matter of fact, we've got one that I spoke to last night. Um, they've got they've got an event coming up and they have no concept of how they're going to be able to market for this event and they're not really good at that kind of stuff but it is the, the one event that could cover all of their needed expenses for the year uh, for the organization if executed properly so we're going to have a conversation um, about that they can't afford to pay and I don't have a problem with it so we're, we're doing the things that we can for that right I mean this would be this would be something like you know um in fact, I talked to somebody not all that long ago that they were a franchise owner for a CC's Pizza. Or, excuse me, a Little Caesar's Pizza. I hate to say CC's. A Little Caesar's Pizza. And what they do is anytime a, anytime a homeless person comes in, they'll give them a slice of pizza and something to drink for free. Right? Just something you can do. Right? That's being social. It's providing back to society of what you can do. Cause marketing is marketing for what somebody else is doing. Social business is what can you do with your services. That would be like, um, you know, if you're a massage therapist, for example, um, doing five massages a month for veterans at no charge. You know, that's one of those kind of things. Or, you know, providing, you know, providing a dessert deal for, uh, if you're a bakery, providing a dessert deal for those that are homeless or, or whatever, taking them down to Woodlawn and, you know, hey, let's do cookies or cakes for everybody for, you know, a, a neat little thing. Just be social in that way and do something for the purposes of helping everybody out. The last thing... Start a blog. It's a little different. Uh, you know, a lot of forward-thinking companies are familiar with the benefits of blogging. One of the concerns that I've heard from many people over the years is, well, if I tell them everything they need to know in the blog, then why do they need me? It'd be kind of like you giving away the recipe for all of your cakes on your blog. People say, well, why do they need you? Because you're not marketing to the people that want to do it themselves. You're marketing to the people that want to pay you to do it. Right? But lots of people want to know anyway. I mean, I know the, I know the basics of how to do a massage. It don't mean that I want to try to massage myself. You know what I'm saying? I mean, I know how to bake a cake, but I'm not baking my son's birthday cake. That reminds me I need to order that today. Good side note, he needs a birthday cake. Um, so, do you know Marshmallow? Have you heard of the, the DJ Marshmallow? He wants a Marshmallow birthday cake, basically a white cake with white icing with the little Marshmallow logo on top of that. I told him, I said, that's the most basic thing that you could ever ask for. He said, I don't care, it's what I want. Wow. I, I don't know. But teach people how to do it. You know, in bakery, give, give away your recipes. Because not everybody's going to bake this stuff. Right? There's lots of things that you can do. Lots and lots of things. Matter of fact, um, I had a lady because I, I smoke a lot of meat. And so for Thanksgiving, I smoked uh, big ham for um, Shay's employees for a Thanksgiving lunch, right? And so one of Shay, one of the other managers there was like, that's the best ham I've ever eaten in my entire life. How did he do it? So I told her how I did it. She was like, will you do it for me? Will you, for Christmas, will you make me one? Because I've got to feed my family for Christmas. And so a ham would be amazing. Could you smoke a ham like that for me for Christmas? That would be great if you could do that. Told her how to do it. She knows how to do it. It doesn't mean she's going to, right? doesn't mean that everyone has the equipment to do it. It also doesn't mean that everyone has the skill to be able to follow the directions in such a way to get the same result, right? <clears throat> yeah, there's a capacity, especially when it comes to cooking and baking. You can give some, two people can have exactly the same recipe and it tastes very different, right? So, you know, looking at that kind of stuff, don't be afraid to give away the farm. 
in, in this kind of area by starting a blog, effectively what it does is it draws more people to you because you're kind of taking away that curtain and, you know, and, and showing this is reality. This is really what it looks like. How you add them in, how much you beat it, you know. It is. It's very much science versus artistry. I mean, it, it kind of goes that, you know, I've made fun of Jasmine for years for making certain things. You know, it's, it, it's funny. And, and you know, the, la the, the last time she tried to make pancakes, I mean, the things were like Frisbees. You know what I'm saying? She had beat that batter to a pulp to the extent there was no air left in it, so there's no possibility of it being fluffy. I'm like, just fold it together. You need the air in this. Matter of fact, inject some air. If you can inject air in there somehow, put some air back in this thing because you need it for the fluffiness. But she did follow the recipe. She followed the recipe exactly as the recipe stated, but she didn't have the skill. She didn't understand the skill of folding something in as opposed to the idea of just taking it, you know, you can't do that when you're baking anything. You'll, you'll make bricks as opposed to nice fluffy cakes and all that kind of stuff. So, uniqueness and value, you got to stand out. There are lots of ways to stand out. These are 10 ideas on standing out, but in order to grow your business, in order to grow as a business, you have to be different. Customer need. When you talk about challenges that entrepreneurs have, customer need is one of those challenges that, that oftentimes we don't really pay attention to. Okay? I mean, the, kind of the issue that, that falls along in all of this is the fact that when your customer trusts you, when they, when they really feel like they have that relationship with you where they can trust you, then they're going to buy from you, right? I mean, people have said it for years. In order to buy from you, they need to know you, like you, and trust you. And so that being said, one of the things that we know is that when you have high trust, you can also demand a higher price. You look at, you look at virtually any fast food type restaurant. You have some fast food restaurants that charge large amounts for their food and some fast food restaurants that are dirt cheap, right? You get some restaurants... Um, there's a, a restaurant here in town called Steak and Shake, right? You go into Steak and Shake and you get a $4 meal, right? Burger and fries, four bucks, right? And you add a drink to it, you got six bucks, you know, for a full meal. Now, you can't even get a basic combo at Chick-fil-A for six bucks. Zaxby's, you better double that up, right? So the difference is, though, is that in these kind of scenarios, when we look at the average, the average idea of service and trust in these organizations, I know if I'm going to Steak and Shake, I'm going to be there a while. Now, this realistically should be a quick burger joint. It's all basic, right? Yes. And rarely, yes, rarely are there a ton of customers in there. And, and so it should be fairly basic, so it should be fairly quick. So why is it I've got to wait 35 minutes to get a burger that's been sitting over there, you know what I'm saying, for a while? And then, God forbid, I decide after the meal to order a milkshake, i got another 45 minutes, okay? And it, it's been this way in virtually every steak and shake I've been in. Now, I do like their food. I think the food is, is pretty decent for the price, right? The service is terrible. There's no trust. Matter of fact, there are lots of times that I would like to go there, and I'm trying to think, do I have two hours to sit there today? No. Okay. Next. And then I look at other organizations, like I said, like a Zaxby's or a Chick-fil-A or, or some organizations like that. There, there is a higher trust in the service and in handling of my needs, Right? So therefore, they can, in general, demand a higher price for chicken breast, however you want it. 
right? Pretty much uh, Chick-fil-A and Zaxby's are the same thing. It's how do you want your chicken breast, right? Do I want it steamed? No, it's not. It's it's not the melting pot. No, I don't want to. I don't want to boil my chicken breast and try to eat it on a stick. No, it's, they charge a really high price for boiled meat. I don't like it. Do you like boiled meat? Don't like boiled meat. Yeah, you like medium rare chicken breast? Yes. I enjoy salmonella. It's uh, it's my friend. Um, <laughs> We get along well, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah, so if you if you start putting that medium rare chicken breast on some sushi, I'm out. <laughs> Throw that out there. I do like me some sushi, but no, no, not not with something that's gonna not with something that's gonna lead off very very poorly. Um, speaking of, real quick, I had a, a a good friend of mine used to work for me. It actually worked for me for about nine years. Uh, we were in. Virginia, and he was really tired one night, and so he went into the he went into the freezer and had bought a bag of chicken fingers. You know, most chicken fingers, by the way, that you buy that are pre-breaded and pre-bagged are actually pre-cooked. So effectively, all you really need to do is warm them up. Apparently, he did not buy the pre-cooked version, and so he decided because he was really tired this day and the other that he would pull out a chicken finger and just eat it. You know. I'm, Kind of an idiot move, but uh, you know he he definitely paid for that uh, the following couple of days. Um, he actually had to take off work the next day because of it, so it caused some issues. So let's stay away from medium rare chicken breast. All right, even if it is a customer need, if you're my customer, I'm going to refuse that for you because of the potential for a lawsuit. Right. So anyway, the. Customer needs. The, the, the idea here of building trust, the trust doesn't happen in a vacuum, right? There are lots of parts to building customer trust. You have to remain consistent in your messaging. You have to do lots of things in order to be able to build this trust. And so that being said, this is what we have to do in order to handle the needs of the actual customer. And the problem for most entrepreneurs is they realistically don't do this. There are several areas that we're going to talk about here in just a second. But there are a number of these areas where they, they fall down. The first, area, the first area that has to be addressed in customer need is being accessible. Being accessible. What do I mean by being accessible? Okay. Being there for the customer? Absolutely. Absolutely. So in, in other words, you need to be available for the customers and, and allow the customers to be able to interact with you. It's one of the challenges that I've had with McDonald's lately, right? Because I can remember years ago, by the way, um, I can remember years ago, especially when I was a kid, McDonald's was the place to go, right? McDonald's had a playground. Nobody else had a playground back then. So you could go and play at the playground. There was no charge, no fee for playing at the playground. You just go and play at the playground. And so, you know, the kids had Happy Meals. And the Happy Meals actually had characters, right? So you had Ronald McDonald, and you had Grimace, and you had the Hamburglar, and you had all these different characters that came along with it. And matter of fact, you never knew when you would go into McDonald's when, when one of these characters would actually come out. And as a little kid, it was really cool. You go up, take a picture with the little characters or hug the characters or, or whatever. And so the characters would come out. And every once in a while, you'd see Ronald McDonald. Wow. You know, McDonald's is a happening place to be. Now, today, you're lucky to go into a McDonald's that actually has a playground. They've gotten rid of most of them. You look at a lot of them. A lot of them no longer have playgrounds, right? They no longer have the characters. So... In fact, McDonald's, the quality of McDonald's food has always been mediocre at best. Okay, if we're being honest, it's always been mediocre at best, but the draw has been all the kids wanted to go to McDonald's because of the simple fact that McDonald's had the characters in the playground and they had, they had all the things that would draw in kids. And so kids want to go eat there because of that and parents would want to go, would obviously eat while they're there. So that's how they're spending money in this and the other. But nowadays they've gotten rid of all of that stuff 
But on top of that, I'm going to McDonald's and places now where you don't even speak to a person when you're placing an order. You go up to a kiosk and you click on your, because it's too much trouble to tell someone I need a Big Mac. I have to go and fish through it on a screen to be able to select my Big Mac. So not only has the service become historically bad, right? Now there's no accessibility at all. And matter of fact, the vast majority of people that you talk to, you ask them how they like McDonald's. I don't really like McDonald's. They go there only because of the convenience or because their kids demand chicken nuggets, right? And it still is a relatively cheap place to get chicken nuggets, right? But the perception of the organization has gone down significantly over the years. You know, we joke about those things. They installed a third window so you can get your order right. Customers are going to have questions. They want answers. How are you available to be able to answer those questions? If there's nowhere or no way for a person to be able to ask and or get answers, then again, it becomes problematic. I, know, I see this happen all the time on websites. I've seen lots of websites recently that don't have contact pages. There's effectively no way to contact a person should you have a question or a need. Now, to me, that's a complete lack of accessibility. So that being said, it makes me question whether I would even want to do business with someone if I couldn't get a hold of someone to be able to ask a question if I need it. So this means that it, for accessibility, you have to have a customer support infrastructure of some kind. Now, most people, when they're looking at those things, they say, well, wait a minute, I have customer support infrastructure, though, that, I mean, that's costing me money. It's not really making me money. But the, the reality of it is, is you have to think about the lifetime value of a customer. Because if a person will come back and they will keep coming back, take, take um, Steak and Shake, for example. Their prices on their meals are so low, they realistically need lots of repeat customers in order to offset the acquisition cost of a customer. But if their support structure for customer service is next to nil, then it's problematic. Now, I haven't eaten there in quite some time and I haven't eaten there in quite some time mostly because of the the fact that the last time we went there it was 45 minutes after we placed our order before we got food it was later in the evening there was there were very few people actually in the restaurant so it took 45 minutes to cook four hamburgers and I, my kids were upset they were tired matter of fact my son fell asleep on the table because we waited so long. This is ridiculous. And then I approached a manager about it to say, hey, you know, what's the deal? What's the problem? And the manager acted like he didn't care at all. Now, what does that do for repeat business? Yeah. Kills it to a place that my kids actually enjoy. See, my kids like going to places where they serve milkshakes. So if we can get a milkshake, they like to go to a place where they can get a milkshake. So for me, looking at it, it's a relatively inexpensive meal overall, even though I've got you know, a pile of kids. And it's a relatively inexpensive meal overall. The kids can get a milkshake. And, and by the time I buy the meal plus the milkshake, it's the cost of the, a typical meal at virtually any other sit-down restaurant. Right? So that being said, it, it would make me happy should they have a customer support infrastructure. However, you know, with not having that, it keeps me from going back on a regular basis. Every once in a blue moon. Got to be accessible. Number two is you must have a reliable product. I'm going to knock on the Dollar Tree just a minute for this. I like the Dollar Tree. People buy things for emotional reasons, not logical reasons. Okay, Lots of people like to argue those kind of things. Well, I need a phone charger, so I'm going to buy a phone charger. What kind of phone charger are you going to buy? Do what? <laughs> you want from Dollar Tree? Yeah. 
I mean, so the question becomes is, is, you know, if I look at that, matter of fact, Jasmine came in last night. She went to Target and bought a phone charger. I'm like, why'd you buy a 10-foot phone charger? She said, well, it was the longest one they had and the cheapest of, of what they had. Okay, so is that a logical decision or an emotional decision? She said she bought it based on its length and the price. One would automatically assume that it's a logical decision. Maybe. Yeah, I mean, it could be more logical. Granted, she stopped at Target because it was on her way home. Okay. But it's still an emotional decision. Were there other options? She actually purchased a cord that had a design on it. Right? And so, again, there's emotional reasons that trigger that purchase, not pure logic. Right? So that being the case, you, you, you look at this, this idea of a reliable product. I'm going to go back to Dollar Tree just a minute. When's the last time you bought any sort of electronic anything at the Dollar Tree? They do. They do have electronic stuff. Remember, they have a lot of electronic accessories, right? You can buy phone cords. Now, you know, they don't sell iPhone cords, at least not that I know of, but they do sell um, Android type uh, phone cords, the micro SD or mini SD or whatever, whatever those things are called. Um, so they sell these cords, right? And they, they sell flashlights. You know, they, sell, they sell those types of items. So you can buy a lot of those types of items. But what I found with that is it's, a, it's hit or miss. You buy it, it may work, it may not work. Right? You, you get what you pay for? Sure. But my question is, is you know, if, you're, if you're looking at that kind of stuff, how do you feel? If you buy something and that thing doesn't work, how does that make you feel? Cheated? Absolutely. You know, I have to give kudos. Um, there's a store in town called uh, Dirt Cheap. Oh, yeah. Right? It's the jankiest store I've ever seen. Okay? You go in and there's just bins of junk. Right? There's shelves with just random crap all over the shelves. There's boxes of stuff that's open and, and this, that, and the other. And... We went in, uh, we went in, matter of fact, this past year before Halloween, and they had a display of fog machines. Okay, they're 30 bucks at Walmart. They were $21 at Dirt Cheap, a little cheaper than Walmart. They had the fog juice and all that kind of stuff. And I thought, that would be cool to add to our Halloween display. Let me buy it. Let me just get this fog machine. So I got the fog machine. I threw it in the buggy. I get all the way up to the front. And the little cashier at the front, he said, did you test that out? No, I didn't. He said, let me give you a suggestion. He said, because all cells are final. He said, so you may want to go over there. There's a plug-in right over there. You may want to go over there and test it out just to make sure it works before you purchase it because once I scan it and you pay, it's done. You can't get your money back. We don't give refunds. Okay, cool. So I went over there and tested it out. It didn't work. Right? didn't. And I thought... How mad would I have been had I spent that $21 and got home to plug it in, get all excited about the, you know, the kids playing the fog and this, that, and the other, and the next thing you know, it doesn't work, right? So, now I don't know why it didn't work, but it didn't work, and I really didn't feel like going back there and plugging one, different ones in to, you know, get one that worked, but, you know, that guy gave me the warning because, again, all solar final which that was nice that actually built a little trust even though i didn't trust that particular pot product to get built some trust for the store right which was impressive to me and so you go back to this whole idea of having a reliable product it's one of the gripes that i have about it as seen on tv products about half of them are pretty cool and about half of them just stink i mean they're terrible they don't work at all right matter of fact i think for me one of the things is if they got somebody famous on the package, I don't usually buy it because usually they've spent all the money on the famous person on the package as opposed to actually developing the quality product. You know, like the razor that's got the guy from, uh, what is it, Pawn Stars? Yeah. Uh, Shave around. Dude, it's a razor. How do you mess that up? Unfortunately, you can mess that up. But 
you know, it's one of those things. I don't necessarily want to pay for it. And so, you know, when we, when we look at this is we, we have to understand that there's a challenge. And the challenge is, is when your customer has your product, they will make a decision about their trust of your organization based on that product and how that product works. Now, that being said, we see that publicly these days very often. You look at Amazon, look at products on Amazon and see how many reviews are listed. Right? This is what people do. People look at reviews. They look at product reviews. They look at service reviews. They look at company reviews. They look at these things. So people can build trust or have trust destroyed based on these things, based on these reviews. Now, building a reliable product also means that, that we need to understand what the customer needs in this particular product. Right? And it doesn't matter what the product is, whether it's a, a chicken breast sandwich, whether it's a cake or whatever it may be, it needs to be reliable. Now, what would I mean by reliability in baking? Consistency. consistency is different. We'll talk about consistency in a minute. Quality needs to be as good as the advertising? Absolutely. Have you ever picked up something and bit into it and it didn't taste anything at all like you thought it would? How do you feel about that? Cheated. Yes, cheated very much so. Yeah, you're, when you're looking at these kind of things, I mean, I, I've, I've done it quite a few times. As a matter of fact, I had uh, my, my mother sent a box of those Petty Fours for, for Christmas, the little bitty cakes. And so sent a box of those things for Christmas, and I'm looking at those things, and I'm thinking, nah, I'm, okay. So I pick it up, and I bite it. It was white on the outside. And, and uh, it's often the case with those things that the color of the icing on the outside is indicative of what the flavor is. So it's white on the outside, so I thought, okay, it's, this one's going to be vanilla. There were brown ones. There were pink ones, right? So chocolate and strawberry. And so I picked this thing up, popped it in my mouth, started chewing, and spit it out because it was not vanilla, it was lemon. Anybody that knows anything about me knows that I hate lemon-flavored things, okay? Lemon heads candy is about the only lemon-flavored thing, um, food of whatever sort that I really care to eat. So, and I don't eat those. I think it's been probably five years since I've eaten one of those. So, you know, I, it was just, it was disgusting, right? So, and, and by the way, then I get to looking on the box for, you know, okay, is there, a, is there a code? Is this like the Russell Stover candies or something where it tells you what's what, what's what? There's nothing on the box. She spent good money on this to get these mystery cakes delivered to my house. And there's no color coding or coding determination of any kind to tell me which of these is going to be disgusting and I need to throw it in the trash immediately. Yes, life is like a box of petty for us. Sometimes it tastes nasty, right? So that being said, you know, so I did what any logical person would do, and I took all the petty fours and divvied them up into sandwich bags and put them into my children's snack boxes because I wasn't going to try to eat another one. Here, children, you can have this. Enjoy. Good luck, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's right, may the odds be ever in your favor. It's like being boozled, you know, that little game with the jelly beans, you know. Is it going to taste like dog vomit or lemon? Either way, I don't want to eat it. Here, you have it. Tell me, tell me how good it is later. Yeah, reliable product. The third, the third is be honest. Be honest. And again, this is, uh, this is one of the challenges that I have with a lot of, a lot of products and services that are out there. They, they say they will do things they won't do. Matter of fact, right before, um, right before I came in here, I was actually testing out for a client, testing out some software for a real estate brokerage that it says in the, in the description that it does this and this and this and this. And I get to look in and I, I'm like, I cannot find how it does that well come to find out in reality what you had to do for it to do what it said that it did you had to pay for extra stuff for it to even do that right it's like feel so deceived you know? 
Be honest. Be honest about your company's strengths and weaknesses. Be honest about your own strengths and weaknesses. Be honest about what your product or service does or does not do or offer. Right? There's no faster way for you to breach customer trust than being dishonest about the things that they're going to get. Right? If it's not right, you should be secure enough to say it's not right. Matter of fact, I had an argument with a client actually yesterday. And I got really ticked off at this particular client because this particular client's in the financial services industry. And so they had a prospect and they were kind of giving me a rundown just to see what my thought process was. They said they had this prospect and, and it was a scenario where a guy had limited funds. He was retired, had limited funds and needed to provide himself with a lifetime income. So he needed to invest this money in such a way that he could generate an income for the balance of the remainder of his life. And the, my client was telling me, well, you know, well, we're going to propose this and this and this and this and this. And it ticked me off. One, because you're suggesting use every dollar that the guy has um, in order to invest to make an income. What happens if an emergency pops up or he needs cash? You're locking it up so he can't get it. So that's problematic. So number two, the number two issue is, is even if, even if you invested every dollar this guy has for what he expects to get out of it, there's no possible way for you to be able to deliver upon his expectations. It's not possible. This client, your potential client has completely unrealistic expectations. You need to walk away from this deal, period. You know, and so we ended up in argument because they didn't want to walk away from the deal. I mean, the deal had the potential to make a lot of money for them, right? And so, yeah, I mean, here, here you're talking about something that, that they would make roughly thirty to $40,000 off of, but would not do what they were telling the client they could do. It's not possible. So you're not going to do it. Because either you're going to tell, call them and tell them that you're not going to do it, or I'm going to save you the honesty. I may cost you the money, but I'm going to save you the honesty. I'll pick up the phone and call this person and tell them you can't do it. They don't know who I am, but I'll let them know. Right? It's important. Imagine what would happen if this guy had invested, if this guy did invest all of his money into this, and he was only getting roughly 60% of what he thought he was going to get. Income for life. Now it's locked up. Right? Oops. You got a guy that you'd have to send, somebody have to send him back to work after he's retired just to cover basic stuff, which he may have to do anyway. But if it's not right, if what you're offering is not right for someone, then you need to let them know. Number four, bring value. Bring value. The question is, do you put the customer first or do you put revenue first? Customer should always come first before the revenue. It doesn't mean that you need to do everything you do for free. That's not what we're getting at. What we are getting at is the fact that, that your target, your focus has to be on win-win. Putting revenue first by definition becomes a win-lose scenario. You win, they lose. Putting the customer first means that you have to focus on that win-win ideal. And so if, you, if all you're doing is you're looking at people and you're, you're picturing them as a dollar sign on their forehead, then ultimately what's happening is they may still buy from you. They may believe that your product will solve one of their problems, one of their issues, one of their challenges or whatever, but it will not build long-term trust. And in today's day and age, long-term trust is important. That's the only way to build any type of brand loyalty. It's the only way to maintain credibility. It's the only way to build authority. You have to build that long-term trust. And it's the only way to continuously get repeat business. You can't get referrals or word-of-mouth business without long-term trust. And the final thing is 
you have to maintain consistency. Maintain consistency. You know, there's nothing more frustrating than doing business with someone and it's great this time and it kind of stinks the next time. And then it's, and then it's great and then it's mediocre, right? There's, there's nothing more frustrating than a lack of consistency in dealing with an organization. Matter of fact, um, Whitley, my oldest daughter, her favorite restaurant's Olive Garden. Now, I like Olive Garden. I, their, their food, for the most part, is okay. It's not real Italian, okay? Um, but I love their salad, right? Olive Garden has great salad. So most of the time I go, I'll either get just the salad or I'll get soup and salad. I don't order most of the meals that they have. They're, they're fine. It just doesn't fall necessarily in my wheelhouse. I could sit there and eat three of those big bowls of salad myself. It's so good, right? And so I like going there from time to time, especially if I have a craving for salad. And I'll tell my wife, I'll tell Shay, I'll say, you know, yeah, at the end of the day, I, 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 want some, I want some Olive Garden salad. I don't care about anything else. Just give me some Olive Garden salad. I might order an appetizer of calamari to go with it. I may order a bowl of soup to go with it or whatever, but at the end of the day, I want the salad. And so I like that, Whitley's favorite restaurant. Matter of fact, she asks, just about every year, she asks for us to take her there for her birthday, right? And so we go to Olive Garden, and it's that cons the consistency issue is the challenge that I have with that particular restaurant, because I'm torn. I love their salad, right? Matter of fact, I buy the dressing, the bottles of dressing, and eat it at home. Right, but sometimes I'll go and they'll have like this amazing server. Right, and you get to have an amazing experience, and they refill your drinks, and you don't even ask about it. And they're coming and asking you, "What do you need?" And they're bringing you more breadsticks whenever you you have to ask for it. One of my in key indications, by the way, of the quality of the future service for from this particular individual is if I order soup and salad as my meal. And you come to the table and my salad bowl is empty. And you don't immediately bring me a, a replacement for it. Then I can tell you that the service is not where it needs to be. There's, a, uh, there's another restaurant over in, in Homewood called the Shrimp Basket. Quality restaurant. The, we, Shay and I, we like to eat there. Uh, from time to time, and we went the other day, and they had a um, they have a deal on certain days of the week where it's different all you can eat stuff, and so they had like all you can eat popcorn shrimp, and so I thought I'll get that. It's like a dollar more than the regular order of popcorn shrimp, and I can always get some and take it home and eat it the next day. Perfect. My shrimp in my basket was getting very low, and the little lady comes out and brings me another basket of shrimp. She didn't ask me if I wanted more. She just brings more, right? She noticed it was getting low, and she brought more. The one thing I can say about the shrimp basket, it's not the biggest restaurant in the world. It's not the nicest restaurant in the world. The food is good. But every single time I have been in that location, it has been consistent. The service has been consistently good, and the food has been consistently good, right? And that's what people look for. I, there's certain places I look forward to doing business with because it's consistent, right? So we set this set of expectations that comes around all this. We, we have to set, we need to maintain consistency in our service. We need to maintain consistency in our brand. We need to maintain consistency in our products. If you're baking cakes, for example, I need to, you to make sure that you bake it with the same consistency every time. I don't need to get a great bite of cake one time and the next time I order a cake, it's like completely different. Because again, it begins to destroy trust. Lack of consistency destroys trust. Consistency of an organization also helps people understand what their role is within the organization. Inconsistencies in organization lead to questions about roles, which also leads to service issues. 
Your message has to be consistent. Who are you? And what do you offer? It needs to be consistent. In fact, we've got a client right now that, that I'm very frustrated with because they keep changing their message. It's like they buy into this cultish idea of somebody tells them something and it sounds pretty decent, so I'm going to immediately buy into that. And then somebody else tells them something different and they buy into that. And then somebody else tells them something different and they buy into that. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's this constant grabbing for stuff. And I tell them, this is why you're broke. You know, they're not really broke, but they could be making a lot more money than they're making, right? Yeah. And that's the end of the key. That's, that's the end of the day. The message that you're sending out, by the way, to all of your customers and potential customers is consistently different. At least there's consistency in your differences, even though it's not a good thing. They don't know who you're going to be tomorrow. Right? Your design needs to be consistent. Your delivery needs to be just consistent. Everything that you do in your communication, in your interactions, those kind of things need to be consistent. That's one thing that I know people can rely on. I, I, I may have lots of faults, but I am consistent. I will treat you with respect, but I will also tell you where you need to be consistently. I will tell you what you're doing wrong consistently. If you suck, I'm going to tell you you suck. I'm going to tell you how to fix it. But I will tell you you suck consistently until it's fixed. I'm kidding. Well, not really. Eh, it's all perception. <laughs> Trust is a byproduct of commitment to quality. It's a, a byproduct of excellence and you know, ultimately, it's the understanding that you can deliver the right results to the right people at the right time, right? And when that happens, people will continue to believe in you. They'll continue to believe in your product or service offerings. They'll continue to believe in your organization, and they will continue to grow with you over time. Don't, don't handle that need well, and you will consistently struggle in your business. All right, so a solution without a problem. Of course, entrepreneurial challenge. Entrepreneurial challenges, this is probably one of the biggest pre-startup challenges that I see, period. And oftentimes it's a challenge that we see ongoing um, in many different types of businesses and different types of industries. Now, what do you think I mean a solution without a problem? So thinking that there's a problem, need to fix it. Okay. So is this trying to find a solution when you don't have a problem yet? So like a preemptively trying to solve future problems? Kinda. So one of the most common and and one of the most deadly mistakes in entrepreneurship is creating a solution before you first identify the problem. Okay. And it, it sounds kind of backwards in reality of, of it, it is. Um, lots of times people have this thing, they, it's the next big idea, right? Um, we see a lot of times these kinds of things pop up on shows like Shark Tank and, and all that. And you see lots of products. Um, I, one of my favorites is, is a lot of the as seen on TV products. Right, so you get this, as, you see this as seen on TV product, and it's it's a nifty little product, but there's no real problem that goes along with it, right? And so what happens is is oftentimes we get these ideas for these products or services that we want to offer, and and we don't really do the research first to find out if it's going to be something that could be successful. Is the market going to accept it? So on and so forth, and that's. That's one huge challenge that most people don't recognize is there's a difference between market awareness and market acceptance. 
What's the difference? Okay, they know something doesn't mean they necessarily like it or want it. Okay, what else? So market awareness is very simply the awareness that something exists, right? So you can have branding, brand strategy, you can have this kind of stuff. Um, all day long to make people aware. You can place ads on Facebook and Google ads and you can do all this kind of stuff to make people aware that you, that it, you exist or your product or service exists. And it's extremely important. In marketing, you lose 100% of the sales from people that don't know you exist, right? However, the awareness that something exists is not the same thing as market acceptance. Market acceptance is more along the lines of accepting that this is a solution to a problem, that it's a viable solution, right? So in other words, if I create a solution and I don't have a specific problem, oftentimes what happens is, is we struggle. We struggle with marketing. We struggle with this idea of market acceptance. Matter of fact, um, I had an had a appointment <clears throat> with one of my clients earlier this week that is a business owner and he's, he's working on starting a brand new business. And I can't go into all the details about the, the brand new business, but the, the, he gives me this concept and the first thing I did was laugh. And he looks at me and says, okay, so are you laughing because it's a cute and unique idea or are you laughing because it's ridiculous? And I said, both. It's cute and unique, but it's also ridiculous. And in, in fact, it, it's, it's a challenge. It's, it's a direct challenge to a concept of the traditional marriage institution that we have had for many, many years about how certain things happen when people get married, right? Can't really give any more detail than that. Uh, but I laughed because it was absolutely ludicrous. And kind of interesting at the same time. And I told him, I said, the hardest challenge that you're going to have is this idea of market acceptance. Because you're challenging tradition, you're challenging centuries, by the way, of tradition of how something happens by offering an idea and a service that changes the strategy. Right? And so he came up with this. He said, you know, and of course he was so proud. And I don't want to knock him down. Is it possible for it to become successful? Absolutely. It could be a huge hit. Could be a new trend. But as I told him, I said, you know, the biggest challenge to overcome is this challenge of market acceptance because you've developed a solution without a problem. There's no problem in the way that, the thing, that things have been done for centuries. No problem in that whatsoever. People don't even think about it or don't consider it. His solution effectively is selfish in essence, right? So it's a solution when a solution is not necessary. And that in and of itself makes it is going to make it much more difficult for it to be a viable business opportunity, right? Doesn't make it impossible, but it makes it difficult. I mean, you think if you... You know, look back 15 years ago, where was Amazon? It didn't exist, right? Amazon came out. Amazon was losing billions of dollars. This idea of an online bookstore people thought was absolutely ludicrous. It was ridiculous. Why would you go to an online bookstore when you got Books A Million or Barnes & Noble? You got locally owned bookstores out here where people could go and find things. You could go to the public library and check out books. Why? I mean, you know, a person, a book nerd like myself, I mean, I like to go and touch and feel and read the back cover and smell. There's something about the smell of good books, right? 
And so you look at that kind of stuff and you say, well, no wonder it was ridiculous. And then Amazon decided to start expanding from books into other products. And today, 85% of all books sold worldwide are sold through Amazon. 85%. The market acceptance, it wasn't the awareness was the issue, it was the acceptance was the issue. And Amazon had to keep throwing money at it, throwing money at it, throwing money at it to the tune of billions of dollars until the market finally accepted it as a completely different concept. Now today, Amazon's one of the largest retailers worldwide, right? So is it possible? Sure, it's possible. But remember, I said they had to spend billions of dollars. Most people don't have that kind of money. Fortunately, Amazon had investors with very, very deep pockets. So when we think about this, when, when we're coming up with product ideas and service ideas and, and, and all that, what we have to first think about is, is there a need in the market? Is there a need for this? The second question that I tend to ask is, is this space, is this space in the market full of companies that are slow and unwilling to change? Because if there's a need in the market and you've got companies that are slower or unwilling to change, then you've got a chance. You've got an opportunity. If not, you really have to do some digging because you may be wasting money and time. If you really want to be successful, the first thing you have to do is find a problem to solve. It's one of the challenges I see today. Um, you know, the, the failure rate for restaurants is, is, I mean, it's just crazy, right? 90% of, 90 of all food service companies fail in the first year, okay? Fail in the first year. It's not great odds for a bakery. Right, And so the problem with that failure in the first year is oftentimes people go into it thinking, I know how to cook this, right? I know how to cook barbecue. I'm really good at barbecuing. I'm really good at smoking meats and those kind of things. Everybody that's ever eaten my food has said, wow, David, this is awesome. I, make some, I, make, I can make some really, really mean fresh green beans with smoked brisket in it. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's really, really good. But I'm not about to go and open a barbecue restaurant tomorrow. There's a ton of them around here. Right? If I were, if I were, I would have to first start by asking myself and asking many others, what is it that you don't like about the existing barbecue restaurants? Matter of fact, what's the biggest problem you see with barbecue restaurants today? other than the fact that there are too many of them, right? Around here anyway. Let's start with that. Because when I start with that, then I can begin to determine what is it, where's the problem first before I design the solution. Some percentage of the population would say, you know what we don't have around here? We don't have a barbecue buffet. Wouldn't that be kind of cool? Barbecue buffet is just like the golden corral of barbecue smoked meats. Right. We kind of do, actually. It's not really a buffet style. It's a fancy restaurant called Texas de Brazil. Right? It's about 50 bucks a person to eat there. They sell a lot of meat. It's delicious. If you've never eaten there, I would highly suggest it if you like meat. If you're a vegetarian, stay away. We don't need you people there. I'm just saying. It's a, it's a meat eater's haven, right? <laughs> no, he did not just say that. Hey, they are a solution, right? There is a problem. You can go to, you can go to the salad bar, right? Just saying. So... You think about this kind of stuff, though. This is the, these are, it, as simple as it may sound, this is one of the biggest challenges that people just completely overlook when they're, when they're starting or trying to grow businesses. They don't think about it. What services do you, do you offer? And one of the other challenges, let me flip this coin real quick. Um, on, on, 
opposite side of the same token is a problem without a solution. A problem without a solution. Um, I've gotten a little frustrated lately with uh, one of my service providers in my house, right? And he's a client. And quite frankly, he's, he's kind of ticking me off because he's the lawn care company, right? Comes and mows my yard. And the reason why I'm a little frustrated is because I'm paying you to take care of my yard. I'm not paying you to mow my yard. I'm paying you to take care of my yard. What's the difference? Yes, there's more to lawn care than, than giving my grass a haircut, yes. I mean, I've got bushes that need to be trimmed. I've got flower beds that need to be weeded, right? There's weeds that need to be sprayed, and the stuff's not happening. And I know I can go out and get a different service provider and pay different money and so on and so forth and get these things taken care of, but that's, that's a problem without a solution, and even though I've discussed it more than once, you know, he hadn't fixed it yet. <clears throat> like, the only reason why you're still cutting my grass is the fact that you're a client. That's it. So, I also have someone who comes and cleans my house. Okay? I don't, I don't clean my own home. I have maid service or call them the ladies, and it's not really a maid service. Um, but they come in and clean my house, right? The more time I spend cleaning my house, cutting my grass and all that, the less time I get to spend with my kids. And so I pay people to do these things. And I was talking to the owner uh, of the company who's also a client. Uh, I was talking to the owner of the company the other day, and I said, you know what, one of the, one of the things, I, I, and I, I can't tell you how many times I've mentioned this over the years that I've known you, but you've never done it, and I don't know why. Is I said, I said, I would love it, to have somebody who could just who could take our clothes, like wash them, dry them, and fold them. Just just take the clothes. Just wash, dry, fold. Matter of fact, you could tell whose clothes are whose. So you can wash, dry, fold, and just throw them on the bed. I'll put them away. I don't even need you to put them away. Right? Just wash, dry, fold. That's it. And by the way, it would it would be even more awesome if I have things that need to be ironed if you couldn't get those things ironed and just take care of that for me. I'm willing to pay for that. Her answer has been in the past, and you know, David, those are housekeeping services, not um, maid service services. So if you're coming into my house and making sure it's clean, is that not part of keeping the house? Well, yeah. Okay. So you're limiting it to cleaning, but you're saying, but you know, here's what I'm telling you. I know lots of people in my neighborhood that would pay somebody to come in and do the laundry. In fact, they would pay you to come and clean the house and pay you extra to do the laundry. They would pay you to clean the house because you would do the laundry. Lots of people. Right? Yes, and do business idea. Yeah, write that, write that down. You know? And I told her, I said, you know, it's not that hard. You could even load up all of the clothes into one thing, take it down to the laundromat, get the big washers and dryers, and, and run all of it at once. You got basically an hour to wash and dry all of the clothes. Then you got a little bit of time folding the stuff and putting it away. And by the way, most of the stuff that needs to be ironed, if you actually put it on hangers when it first came out of the dryer, because I don't have time to do that, you don't have to iron it. Very few things in reality need to be ironed. However, you don't want to take the time to iron, buy a steam cleaner, a steamer. They're about 100 bucks. <laughs> there we go. Looks like it's been freshly ironed. Takes a few seconds to do. I would be willing to pay for that. It's a problem without a solution. So what happens in business is, is people, people consistently do these things, 
right? They're trying to come up with these ideas for the, these, these unique ideas and these u- unique things that they're, oh man, this, this could do this or it could do this or it could do this and there's no problem associated with it. And at the same time, often people ignore completely the problems that their customers are having that they're not addressing that their business could address. It's kind of funny because uh, one of the things that I get asked every now and then, uh, you know, people say, well, you know, David, you've got a number of businesses and this, that, and the other. I say, yes, I do. And, and so they say, well, you know, you must be very busy. Well, I am busy, but, you know, it's not like I work in every single one of the businesses that I have. I don't do, there's some of them I don't do anything with at all. It's just not, not within me to do within there. I have other people that, that take care of that kind of stuff. And I had, was having a conversation with somebody the other day, and they said, well, you know, it's, it's kind of crazy because you own the business consulting firm, and you own a marketing firm, and you own a tax firm, and you own an accounting firm, and you've got an insurance brokerage, and, and you know, you've got this and this and this and this. And I said, yes. And I said, what's the commonality? Because he was actually talking about the fact that this was just an odd array of businesses that I have. And I told him, I said, but there's a commonality. What's the commonality? He struggled. He didn't get it. I told him, I said, it's all business. I said, there are things that business owners struggle with. They struggle with financial systems. They struggle with risk management systems. They struggle with tax systems. Right? I have businesses, so my job as a business consultant is to help specifically in the areas of systems, strategy, marketing, and development. So if that's the case, then it makes sense if those are the problems that they're having, not only can I guide and direct them on what needs to be done, but if I have businesses that do those things, then I can pass them right over to those businesses and say, hey, look, talk to Anastasia. She's our our head accountant, and she can help you with any accounting needs that you might have. And keeps it in-house, in essence. Right? People figure that out. They love it. We own a hosting company. We can host websites. Sell domain names and all that kind of stuff. We, ha- we actually have the hosting company. Well, why? Because we do a lot of that kind of stuff. Especially in the marketing arena. Interesting, right? But a lot of it has come over the years interestingly enough, from the fact that I used to refer those things out and it got to where I couldn't trust people that I was referring things out to. So it became easier for me to start a company doing these things as opposed to referring people out. Because at least then, if one of my staff and one of my companies screws something up, then I can take care of it. Right? Problems. Problems present solutions. Solutions don't necessarily present problems. So what do we need to do? Um, Obviously, it can be very tempting. The next big idea you have to to start working on and start implementing and structuring and, and doing all that kind of stuff. But, I mean, how many people have you seen over the years that have have fly by night opportunities, Right? The older you get, especially for you guys, the, the more of it you're going to see. They're in business one day and they're gone the next. It's an idea, a great idea one day. Everybody's on board with it and it's just disappeared, right? Why? Because market acceptance was a problem. Couldn't get anybody to buy in on it. You got to think hard. Think long and hard about doing this. If it's starting a new company, doing something, you might want to start with something that's not a solution without a problem first. Starting a business is equal parts passion and planning. You got to have the motivation for both. That planning, though, is the key thing. You need to make sure that what you're offering, what you're doing, is something that people are going to pick up on. Second thing I would do is define the problem. What's the problem? You know? 
Obviously, the first thing is, is the what's needed. But the second thing is, is what's the problem? What's the problem that I need to address? What you find is if you start looking at problems first and solutions second, is solutions become much easier. Third thing you need to do is, is know your enemies. Meaning, not literal enemies per se, meaning, has somebody else tried to do this before? How did it work? What happened? What competition are you going to have? Who's your naysayers? Who's going to try to hold you back? Whether lovingly or not. Right? You look at these people that have tried this before, what happened? Did they take on too much too quickly? Did they have inadequate systems and structures? What was the real problem that they had that kept them from being able to be successful for it? Was it, was it maybe that their price point was just way off target? I've seen businesses, more businesses go out of business because of too low of a price point than too high. Did they bring their solution out before the problem really matured? Sometimes there are problems that we can solve out there, but the problem itself is not big enough of a problem in the market's mind for the market to accept that as a problem that really needs a solution. So how big is the problem? The last thing I would say to this is you, you need to build your story. You need to build your story. You, got, you have to have a compelling problem and solution description. There needs to be something that people can buy into. Matter of fact, the, going back to the client that I said about the, you know, challenging the traditional wedding, um, this traditional wedding concept. I told him, I said, the only, the only way you will possibly be able to be successful in this is if you make it funny. It's the only way it's going to happen. It will have to be humorous. People will have to look at it and say, oh my goodness, that's ridiculous, I'm going to do that. It's the only way it will be able to be successful. Because any attempt at seriousness... With this particular concept, any attempt at serious with this particular concept, people will shrug it right off. The market will never accept it at that. So everything about it needs to be humorous. It needs to be humorous, fun, playful. It needs to be that. Because without that, the business is dead before it starts. Now, once you're done with all of this, all this process that I just gave you, now you've got a clearly defined problem. And this, by the way, that clearly defined problem is the factor that will make you stand out over and above the rest of the businesses out there. It's going to help give you the motivation to get it done. And now you'll have taken the first steps, per se, that many entrepreneurs have skipped that ultimately led to their failure. Every solution should have a problem. Every problem should also have a solution. All right, targeting. What do I mean by targeting? Pinpointing your market. Pinpointing your market. Okay. So targeting in, in business is the idea of looking specifically at those people that are most likely to buy from you, right? So one of the biggest challenges, it's why, why we fall, put it under entrepreneurial challenges, is because it's one of the biggest challenges that a lot of businesses have. People will, people will ask, so who's your target market? Many businesses can't really tell you. Or if they tell you, it's very vague. Or if they tell you and it's very specific, it doesn't make sense, right? So the idea here is, is you know, we need to think about, we need to think about this, this idea of targeting. In other words, there's a temptation, 
for a lot of businesses. And that temptation for a lot of businesses is to try to be everything to everybody or market their business in a way that everybody sees it, right? And just because everybody sees it doesn't mean you're creating good branding, okay? Doesn't mean you're doing good marketing. Every business has a target market. What's Chick-fil-A's target market? Okay, so average income over 45000 People who are willing to pay uh, higher price for high quality food. Okay. And looking for something that's quick and on the go. So they're looking for something quick on the go, and they're willing to pay a little bit higher price for higher quality food. Okay. You miss the target. Okay. Even though I know you know what they tell you, right, that, that targeting is. Chick-fil-A targets Christians, okay, if we're being honest, because they make it very known, they make it very known that they live by a Christian set of morals and standards. Now, I'm not saying that's a bad thing by any stretch of imagination, okay? What I am saying in that is I am saying that if we know specifically who our target is, so for setting a location, for setting a location, they want to set a location for 45000 or up income. They want something that's got good business coverage and so on and so forth because people who work tend to like to eat. If there's not many businesses, chances are the unemployment rate tends to be higher. And so we don't want to put an a, a expensive restaurant in Chick-fil-A for a fast food restaurant. It's very expensive. Okay, So we don't want to put an expensive restaurant in a place where nobody can afford it. All right? They need good visibility. They need to be able to get traffic in and out fairly quickly, so on and so forth. But as far as the customer itself, Chick-fil-A targets Christians, and more specifically, the target tends to be Christian families, right? And ideally, they want Christian families with a 45000 or more household income because then you can afford Chick-fil-A and not just McDonald's, right? That's targeting, okay? That's what targeting is all about. So in, in targeting and in marketing, matter of fact, just before, um, just before I cut the video on, we were, we're talking about a, a guy that Steve's working with, and this guy's a, he's a commercial lender, so he lends money to businesses for whatever their needs may be. And the guy spent a bunch of money recording a video that he wants to put on cable TV. And so our question is, is why is cable TV a bad idea. And the, real, the reality of the why it's a bad idea is the inability to target. So if you have somebody watching diners, drive-ins, and dives on the Food Network, and his ad pops up, right? Commercial break, his ad pops up. Do you know if the person that sees that ad is a business owner or not? Can you control that? No, you can't. Now, a lot of TV stations will tell us that we can control it in part because you know, maybe he's getting on CNN or MSNBC. He's getting ads on some place like that where it's more likely that it's business people watching. But that's it. It's just a more likely that it's not hey, we know where these people are, right? Not only that, because of the fact that this is a small business, he has a limited budget. So he's not going to be able to run these ads all the time. So since he can't run these ads all the time, if he has to run the ads because he can only afford 10 p.m. to run the ads at 10 p.m., he's counting on the fact that this one commercial at 10 p.m. this one night is going to air and it's going to air and there are going to be people that are watching that channel and those people will be business owners and they will, not only are they business owners, but they're business owners that need additional funding and will call him. There's a lot of variables there, right? And so it's a lot like firing 10 bullets in random, random 
ways and, and expecting to hit a bullseye on something. Right? Let's play pin the tail on the donkey with an Uzi, right? And see what happens, right? Spin you around and right? it's very dangerous. It's very dangerous. And so for businesses, targeting tends to be a, a big issue. And, and a lot of the issue is, is that you know, we, we try to be either be everything to everybody, we don't get specific enough, or we're, we're trying to get ourselves out there in such a way that everybody will see it instead of being very specific about what we're trying to do. And so, you know, Steve and I were talking about it. He said, that, you know, David, what would you recommend to him as the best opportunity to be able to, to get his stuff in front of the right people? I said, LinkedIn ads. Ads on LinkedIn. Because LinkedIn, when you register for LinkedIn, you put your position. So if you're a business owner, they know you're a business owner. So I can target ads specific to business owners. I know how many employees work at the business. So I can target ads specific to that. For example, if there's no employees, you're a solo person, even though you may be looking for funding, is it a high likelihood for him that he's going to be able to get the bigger deals if he's trying to get a million dollars plus in funding? Probably not. Right? A business with zero employees typically doesn't have all that much credit either. Right? So if we targeted business owners that have at least 50 employees, now we're getting much more specific, right? And so we want to do that over time. And so this concept, this concept leads us to questions we have to ask about our business, about our offerings, right? About our services. And so a lot of times what it does for me is it makes me want to, uh, it, it makes me want to smack people around a little bit and say, you, you're missing the mark. We had, um, we've got a client. And Steve is actually doing um, Steve is actually doing some advertising for the client. And this particular client owns a a music school, right? So he's doing ads for the music school. And the guy called me the other day and said, "Hey, can you come over to my office? I want to talk to you. You want to talk to me about a business idea?" But he also wanted to talk to me about kind of the results of his ads and this that, and the other. And I said, "Okay." And so he started it off with, you know, David, I'm, I'm just not really pleased. I'm not getting enough, enough net students. Enough net students. Now, I humored the guy. The guy spends $400 a month on ads. That's it. 400 bucks. Which is a ridiculous low amount to realistically have any true expectation, but it's a good it's a good place to get started and then continue to increase your budget over time. He said, "Okay." I said, "Okay." I said, "What do you mean?" He said, "Well, you know, in in February we had six net students, and in March we had um, zero net students." Hmm. Really. What do you mean by net students? Well, in February, we had from your ads that you've done, we've had we had twenty new in, new students enroll. So wait a minute, you picked up twenty students for four hundred dollars. You're billing these people one hundred and forty dollars a month. Okay, one hundred and forty dollars a month times twelve is what? Was it eighteen hundred eighty dollars a year for the year? Just under two grand. You picked up twenty students. That's forty thousand dollars nearly in value for four hundred dollars. Dang, I didn't know we were that good. He said, "But David, it's only six net." What do you mean by net? He said, "Well, we lost fourteen students for the month." Of the new students? No. Of existing, previous students. <clears throat> so at what point is your customer retention a problem for my advertising? Think about it. He's judging the, the return on investment of our advertising based on his ability to keep his customers happy. 
Apples and oranges, right? Really ticked me off. I said, so you didn't get any students in March? No, we got 11 new students in March. Dude, that's amazing. <coughs> look, I said, look, for $400 a month, realistically, my goal for you is to get four students. That way, you got your money back for that particular month, and then some. You actually made a return on your investment. So anything over four students, you're doing good. Yeah, but that's not it. That's not my problem. The funny thing is, is that he had been running ads for a long time and just wasn't getting anything off of it. He'd been spending a lot of money on these ads every month before he, uh, he decided to hire us and, and Steve took his account and, and so on and so forth. And, and I get to looking at what he's doing. And the reason he wasn't getting any results was his targeting. I said, I said, okay, tell me about your targeting. So this was kind of an upfront thing. I said, tell me about your target. What does your ideal student look like? He said, between the ages of five and 14. Okay. So kids don't like music after they're 14 years old? Well, no, I just, people don't like music after 14 years old? Well, no, I just, we just find that that's common. I mean, are, are your instructors just very, are they very basic? Are they just teaching people how to, you know, this is how you strum a guitar? I mean, or are, are they teaching advanced stuff? I mean, is it, you got anybody that wants to learn how to play guitar like Jimi Hendrix? You got anybody that can teach you that? Well, yeah. Okay, because, you know, a five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten year old probably not going to do it. I mean, they could be a savant or whatever. Great, congratulations. But, you know, it's the 15, 16, 17, 18 year old kids that have been playing a little while that want to get better at what they do. And you're missing out on that. And, and by the way, at, at 16, 17, 18, a lot of these kids have jobs. And so if they have a job, they can pay your $140 a month themselves. They don't have to have their parents pay for it, they can do it themselves. If they really want to learn it and have a passion for it. Why well, never thought of that? Huh. Say, so, okay, tell me about your tell me about your targeting on your ads. He said, Well, we're targeting 24 to 35 year old females with children. Income over fifty thousand dollars in an eight mile radius of us. It was very specific. It's very specific. I said, Well, that, there's a problem. It's a very specific target. Problem is, how does it match with their ideal student? Yeah, I mean, if you're 24 year old with a 14 year old kid, you so you got pregnant at eight, you know, nine. I mean, it does take nine months to cook them bad boys in the oven. You know what I'm saying? So, even if you're 35, you got pregnant at 20. So effectively, what you're talking about is you're, you're limiting your market, in essence, to teenage moms or very young moms. You realize most people don't really start making real money until they're 35 years old? I mean, for real? So the percentage of people that are, the females that are 24 to 35 that have an income over $50,000 because he wasn't talking household income. The percentage is small. Throw it out there. Not just because they're female, but just because they're 24 to 35 years old. And $50,000 income is 25 bucks an hour. Right? If you're in L.A., it's fine. But he's not in L.A. He's in Birmingham, Alabama. Where the average household income is fifty grand total. I said, I told him, I said, 
I modified your targets, and that's how we got the. That's how we're getting the result. I said number one, <clears throat> we change it from 24 to 35, to 28, to 55. Because at 55, if you have a 14 year old now, now the 55 year old women aren't likely to have a five year old child. It's possible. Okay, not likely, but it's possible. You got pregnant at 40. One thing we know, there are a lot of women out there that are getting pregnant later in life. Not, not, as, many, not as many women are getting pregnant in their 18, 19, 20s as, as used to be, right? Census data tells us that. Okay. 28 to 55, I don't care if it's male or female. He said, but the women more often than not make the decision. Well, it's probably because of who you've been targeting. Dude, I'm a musician. I've played for years. I love I said, I, I, I'm the one that had the idea to put both of my daughters in piano lessons. And paid for it as long as they wanted to do it. Wasn't my wife's idea. My idea. So you're saying I'm not good enough for you? What are you saying? Right. <laughs> we'll go with the children, yeah. I am. I, I'm definitely beyond his uh, his age target that he had there, right? Income over fifty thousand bucks, but we want household income over fifty thousand bucks, right? Eight mile ra radius is stupid. Let's do fifteen mile radius. Eight mile radius is too narrow, right? Fifteen mile radius it needs to be. Interested in music? Let's go with that. Because guess what? If you got parents that are interested in music, chances are they're going to want their kids to be interested in music, so they're going to pay, right? Huh? We added. I added a variety of other things to this, but <clears throat> Steve got the ads and so on and so forth, and, and figured it out. Now, that being said, this is called targeting. So we, we need to know these things, by the way. Age, age, by the way, is rarely a factor. One of the things that Steve's going to test on this is he's going to take the age restrictions off and just go without age. And the client said, why would you do that? So let me ask you this. You got three kids. And you yourself, Mr. Business Owner, are charging $140 a month per child. That's $420 a month to get all three kids' music lessons. Because you don't offer discounts currently, which is stupid as well. Tell me you need to offer discounts for mul having multiple children. But I said, so what are you neglecting there? You had 24 to 35 well, so let's say you got mama here is 24 to 35. Mama's 35. Mama's got three kids, ages 14, 12, and 10. She'd like to have all three kids in music lessons, but it's a car payment every month. Now, let's flip this token. Let's say you got grandmama out here. Grandmom and granddaddy, they got three grandkids that they would love to sponsor their grandkids for music lessons and pay for those lessons for them. And grandmom and granddaddy have been around a lot longer. A lot of their bills are paid off, so it's not as big a dent into their disposable income. But it's a great gift from grandmom and granddaddy. Why would you not want those people to pay for music lessons for their grandkids? Why would you deny them that right? Well, I wouldn't deny them. I said, well, you're not, you're not putting it in front of them either. Grandparents, on average, will spend more on grandchild than parent will for, for those types of extracurricular things. I mean, for that matter, if, uh, if Jace said, hey, I want to get into music lessons, and he told his Aunt Kelly, Shay's sister, hey, I, w I really want to get into some music lessons, Kelly say, how much are they, and where do I send the check? Right? but you're not allowing that person 
to do that. And not that you want to be everything to everybody because I wouldn't target the Aunt Kellys of the world, right? It's very difficult to target that kind of stuff. But to target specifically this and to target grandparents of grandchildren that are interested in music, they're going to want to, they're, they're much more likely to begin paying for that as we can see based on the results that we get. So we had the discussion about shut up about net results because your client retention is not my problem. You're not paying me for that. I can only go with the results that you get, not the results that you dream about, especially for your budget. Um, so how do we do all this? How do we do all this? Well, there's several different ways. Right? We want to avoid the mistake of trying to appeal to everyone. So one of the first ways that, that we can begin is by surveying, right? Right? We want to survey. And we could do that through social media polls. Ask people on social media. Right? It's an easy way to get it. Social media polls are a great way to find out more about customers and potential customers. And by the way, don't be afraid to spend a few bucks on it. Create a poll, boost it. Pay 30 bucks to boost the thing. See what kind of responses you get and go from there. It's a good start. What do people want, right? Poll people, find out what they want. If you have built an email list, then send out emails. Ask people what they want. We're coming up with the greatest, uh, the next greatest idea for our bakery, you know. We've got ideas for these cake flavors. Which one would you choose? We're thinking about jalapeno cookies. How do you feel about that? Have you ever had a jalapeno that has all the all of the stuff taken out of it so you don't really get the heat? It's actually very sweet. So you blanket said no to that. But there's a percentage of people that would buy it. Just like the people that buy cupcakes with bacon on the top of them. They're idiots, I call them, but people seem to like that kind of stuff. Why? Because it's different. And things that are different can turn into trends. So which of these would you be most likely to try? Just saying. Don't discount it before you ask. Right? Point is, ask. So social media polls, online surveys, and email surveys. You know, surveys are, are one of the best ways to be able to get good information. You see it all the time, by the way. Fill out this survey for a chance to win this. Right? Fill out this survey for 50% off your next cake. Right? I wish Edgar's would send that out because I'd like to have one of those strawberry cakes right about now. It just sounds good. Shay's got me on this diet, and my birthday's Saturday. So, I'm like, she was like, what do you want for your birthday? I can't have what I want for my birthday anyway, so therefore, don't even ask me, because I'd want a strawberry cake from Edgar's because it's really good. I like strawberry, it's my favorite flavor. And their cake is good. So, I get nothing. Moving on, all right? Don't poll me. Don't ask me specifically when you know I can't have it. Right? That's a good overall recommendation, by the way, for polling and surveying. Don't, if, you're, if you don't have the ability to make it, don't poll about it. Don't survey about it. Third thing would be analyze current customers. Analyze your current customers. What are people buying? How old are they? What do they look like? This is something that people, people rarely do, especially for existing businesses. They rarely do. They don't look at their customer base. It's kind of interesting because um, in the business coaching stuff that we do and all that, the average, um, the average client that we're dealing with on, on the small level clients has been in business between 12 and 15 years. That's our average, oddly enough. Had no idea until we started doing some analysis ourselves. 
the average they've been in business between 12 and 15 years before they came to us. Right? So, what do your customers look like? How old are they? Our average clients in their late 40s, uh, late 40s to early 50s in that same prospect area that we're talking about. What's your audience look like? Are they primarily male or are they primarily female? Or does it matter? It may not matter. What's the average income if it's important? Right? What are their profession? What are their interests? If you're going to have a, a massage therapy business, what do you need to know? Who gets massage? You put a massage therapy business in the middle of Amish country, chances are you're probably not going to get a lot of business. Right? I'm just saying. I mean, it sounds, it sounds stupid. And I'm using these, these somewhat stupid examples but it's the reality of what people do just exacerbated. People do this stuff all the time. They don't ask any questions. They don't pay attention. They don't look at people. I mean, even though, you, even though you don't necessarily have a bakery open just yet, you can tell by looking at all the people that you've done stuff for. Right? Write it out. What do they look like? What's the picture of these people? And in fact, I would highly suggest for your first couple of years in business to track all of your customers. Make yourself a breakdown sheet. Track it. Because that gives you a really great idea. It gives you a really great idea of who you're dealing with. Who's coming to you most often? Analyze the competition. So you got current customers. Who's your competition? There's always competition, whether it's direct or indirect, by the way. I'm sorry, but indirect competition, people that, people that offer services similar to yours. Maybe it's a primary service for you, but it may be an ancillary service for them. Could be, yeah, Publix, um, for the bakery, it would be uh, Publix, Walmart, Sam's Club. Those are, those are more indirect competition because it's not, you know, they're not just a bakery. They do other things, and a bakery is ancillary product or service so to it. Eggers is direct competition. Yes. So you got to compete with that strawberry cake, I'm just saying. Oh, snap. Have you ever tasted their strawberry cake? Mm -hmm. Now you got to figure out how to do it better. Yes, it is very sweet. You want very small slices. You know, one thing I would like for them to do, make a much smaller version of it. Cupcake version of it would be great. They do. Um, I did go into the bakery once. I've only actually been, I've had that cake twice. Um, I've only actually been into the bakery ever one time. Um, and so that one time they were selling some individual slices of it, which is cool. But... If I'm buying cake for my whole family, then if, if we're buying it for dessert for tonight, I don't necessarily want the big honking cake that could last for days, especially when you can only eat a thin slice because it's very sweet and it's delicious. But you can only realistically eat a thin slice. And so, I mean, I guess it's good if you're counting calories that you can only eat a thin slice. But there's not, there's not options as far as the size of the cake, right? And... I personally would like for there to be some options. You know, they give me the strawberry small, give me the strawberry regular, whatever. You know, because my family could my family could eat dessert. If I'm buying the strawberry cake for a dessert, I could I could do about a quarter of the size of their cake, and I would be fine buying a half that size, the size that it is. Um, but and it's like forty bucks or something for that cake. Right? I mean, it's so. I'm paying $40 for a cake, chances are, I mean, we're going to eat off of it once, maybe twice, and the rest of it's going to get thrown in the trash because we don't eat sweets all that often. You know, we don't eat dessert every night after meals and, and so on and so forth. So, you know, it's Piper's birthday cake. That was, geez, months ago. It's still sitting in the refrigerator outside. You'll take some. Jasmine said the other day, she said, uh, Dad, you can't throw it away until... Uh, until I, I can chew again. She had her wisdom teeth taken out. Um, 
I can't, you can't throw it away because I've been staring at it. You say, you've just been staring at it because your wisdom teeth were taken out. Yes, I want a piece of that cake. Don't throw it away. It may, may or may not be any good. I don't know. You may have to soak it in milk for a day. Just to, I mean, it's been in the refrigerator for two months. Who eats cake that's been in the refrigerator for two months beside Isaiah? You know? <laughs> so, so uh, you know, you look at that, though. You got to analyze. What, what, are your customers, what are your customers doing? What do your customers look like? And what do your customers want? Because what the customers want is also part of your targeting. Analyze the competition, like I said. That's, that's another area. You generally will know who your competition is. Sometimes you may not, so you may have to do a little research on it. What do they do? And what can you do better? Right? But also, what are they targeting? How are they targeting? How are they getting to their customers? It's funny because one of the things we often hear about, especially about bakeries and those types of places, is we hear, well, we get all our customers word of mouth. Are you controlling the word of mouth? That's the real question. Because there are ways to control it. If you're not controlling the word of mouth, then all you're doing is you're hoping and praying that people keep talking good things about you. A person is seven times more likely to say something negative about you than they are to say something positive about you. So that being the case, that also we also look at statistics that, that given great service, one in seven customers will say something positive about you to someone else. Well, what about the other six? Because you're not prompting nor controlling that. There are ways to do that, right? That, by the way, is, a, is a, another analysis of the competition. What are their marketing strategies and what are they missing out on? The final thing that you need to do is, is take all of this data that you've got, take all this information that you've got, and create now a buyer persona, right? This will, this will let you outline the group or groups of people that are most likely to purchase from you. And by knowing that, then you can target specifically where they are. It gives you the ability to create that storyline. And by the way, the storyline of how people got to you with your target market, your ideal customer, is the same storyline of how other people are going to get to you. So you're effectively creating your own marketing by doing this well. Who are they? Where are they? What do they look like? What do they like and not like? Who else are they doing business with? Right? Now you know. And now you have a good target. And at the end of the day, if you are targeting these people, you know, one of the fears that, that a lot of businesses have with not, without targeting is, oh, I'll miss out on business. I'll miss out on business. Well, sure. Like in our example here, Aunt Kelly, if I'm not targeting the Aunt Kellys, then the Aunt Kelly can't, can't pay for that. But how much does it cost me to target Aunt Kelly's versus targeting these people? A lot. What does that do to my return on investment? By targeting the Aunt Kelly's, it kills my return on investment. By not targeting everybody, by targeting the specific buyer persona that we've just created, it allows me to have a much higher return on investment. A $40,000 return for 400 bucks. That's, that's amazing, and he was griping about it, right? Because he didn't have the picture in his head of what this actually was. Right? You become a specialist instead of a generalist. It's just like in anything else. Specialists make more money than generalists. It's one of the problems with mas most massage parlors. They don't specialize in anything. You see some that have a few special services, which is great. 
I like that. And it doesn't mean that you only have to offer one service. But I've also seen, seen some that I go into in the list of services is like the menu at Cheesecake Factory. Oh my Lord, it's so overwhelming. I don't even want to deal with it. Right? You know, it's, it's one of those, you almost want the Guthrie's right, of the massage world in that sense. I want you to put your hands back here and me to feel better when I go there. You know what I'm saying? I mean, I just, let's simplify this down. Right? But again, there are a variety of services that, that any massage place can, can offer. And so we have to look at how, how are we going to set this stuff up? You know, what are we going to do? What are we going to target? Are, are, are you going to target, like, Massage Envy does a very poor job at it. Um, but they're attempting to target with a subscription package people that want to get massages on a regular basis. They do a very poor job with their marketing and with their actual targeting for that. Okay, But they're trying to build a recurring revenue model that just hasn't taken off because their targeting and the actual marketing for it are off, right? So I respect the model. It would be great. If I know if it normally costs me $90 to get a massage, but if I, if I commit to a 12-month deal, I'm going to get them for 60 bucks a piece, I'm going to do it, right? It just makes more sense. But I've got to be that person that is looking at, hey, this is a good thing. I do this on a regular basis. I'll also tell you, I've been to quite a few chiropractors and we've had chiropractors as clients. One of the few things, most chiropractors that, that I say most, every single chiropractor I've ever been to is, has always recommended getting a massage. But I don't know of very many at all who actually have a place that they recommend because most massage, um, most massage places don't actually market to chiropractor groups which is weird to me. It's your spine, right? What are they, I mean, these people are literally putting you on stem machines to loosen up your muscles enough to where they can actually adjust your bones. And they say, well, you should get a massage. Every now and then, it's a good idea to get a massage. It'll relax those muscles so your muscles don't tense up enough because it's the muscles that pull the, the bones out of whack unless you're suffering from an injury. Okay. So wait a minute, you're telling me if I go get a massage more often, then I have to see you less often. That's pretty much what they're telling you. Huh. Check that out, right? Targeting. This is what it's all about. Don't target, you'll struggle in business. But by targeting, you get much, much more specific. You can make your marketing make more sense. You can make your business model make more sense. And, and it becomes much, much easier to close the sales for the customers. Marketing. So it's definitely a challenge. Um, <clears throat> challenge for a lot of businesses, in, in fact, with as a small business owner, even medium-sized business owners, in a lot of cases, face a lot of challenges with marketing. And so, unlike a lot of your larger corporations, your Coca-Colas and, and companies like State Farms, these, these companies that have a, a billion dollar budgets, your budget tends to be very limited. And so, at larger companies tend to have large teams of people at their disposal. They have, may ha even have departments or divisions that they own specifically for this. They can keep up with the latest innovations in technology, the latest innovations in marketing, and, and so on and so forth. That, as, as a small business owner, we tend to find that these challenges become real. One of the, one of the interesting things, though, is that with digital marketing in the marketing world today, it gives us the capacity to be able to keep up, in essence, with the bigger companies, right? But we have to deal with the challenges. And what I've, what I've found is I've found that there are several challenges that we have to deal with in marketing. The first, the first of those challenges is deciding where to focus. 
This is something I deal with all the time. It's on a regular basis. I hear people I, I hear people say, well, I need this, or I need this, or I need this, and much of it is because of what they've heard, right? You have marketing companies out there that tell us, well, you need to focus on SEO. You need to place some ads on a TV in a restaurant somewhere, right? You need to do this, and you need to do that. And a lot of times, there's no real thought process as to what they want to accomplish and what they're trying to do. You got social media, you got SEO, you got pay-per-click advertising, you've got content marketing, you've got mobile marketing. I mean, there, there are so many options out there that it's a struggle for many businesses to figure out what they, what they need to do. And so with this plethora of options out there, the, the challenge can be in that decision making. Now, when we when we look at this, one of the ways that, that we need to solve this focal issue is to sit back and say, what am I trying to accomplish? Because some things are better than others. For example, email marketing is not all that great at getting new customers. It's a great thing, but it's not all that great at getting new customers. It's, it's really, really good at repeat sales and cross sales. It's really good at nurturing your customer database but it's not all that great for new customers websites not all that great for new customers oddly enough mostly because if a person doesn't know you exist why would they be on your website right so determining what am i what am i trying to do in my business do i need to generate more leads and sales do i have plenty of customers and i need to get more money out of them i need to make more sales from repeat business am i trying to increase my brand awareness to be able to take some of the competition if i can increase market share how do i do it right and so the, this, this lack of thought process in this, because for most people, most people believe that, that marketing is marketing and anything will generate a result. And while it's true, anything will generate a result, it may not necessarily generate the result that you're looking for because it may be the wrong thing for that particular result. In a lot of cases, what we see too is we see business owners that, that will try to learn all this stuff themselves and, and they don't really know what they're looking for, what they're trying to do. And so they'll spend a little time learning this and a little time learning this and a little time learning this and they never get really good at any one given thing. And so they, they don't understand that in many cases it's advantageous to outsource to somebody who's quality as opposed to trying to do it all yourself. And I say outsource to somebody who's quality because the vast majority of marketing companies aren't interested in really growing your business. What they're interested in is that monthly payment that they get from you. I mean, think about it. If, if your business, if you do business with other businesses and you're trying to generate leads and brand awareness with other businesses, then maybe you should focus on being on LinkedIn instead of Facebook is your social approach, right? I had, uh, had somebody not long ago that said, David, I'm, just, I'm, I'm sick to death of spending all this money on marketing. I feel like I'm spinning my wheels. And I said, well, well what are you doing? And he said, we're, you know, we're placing Facebook ads and you know, we're placing lots of, lots of those kind of things. And we're very active on Facebook and we're active on Instagram and, and we're doing all that. And I said, well, what are you selling? He said, I'm selling medical devices to other businesses. I said, well, that's your problem right there. First rule of marketing, go where the customers are. You're not where the customers are. So if you're, since you're not where the customers are, you're not getting the customers. It's that simple, right? Deciding where to focus is super important in your business. What do you need to do? I mean, most people are on Facebook. That's what everybody says, right? I mean, virtually everyone has a Facebook account these days. But it doesn't mean that it's easy to target on Facebook. 
So we have to think about that. Where do I need to focus? Focus on what, first, what are you trying to accomplish? And then second, where are those people at? That's the two rules, right? The second area, the second area they struggle with is differentiation. Differentiation. Differentiation is the process of standing out how you are different from everyone else. It's that idea of what's unique about your business. What's unique about things that people do business with you. You know, the funny thing is, is more often than not, businesses tend to, they, they look at their competitors, in essence, for guidance as to what to do, which is why you see so many businesses out there that do the same stuff. And they're floating in this sea of sameness, this competition pool where, you know, they say all the time, they say, well, you know, I can't increase my prices because so-and-so decreased their prices. And then they get into price battles, these price wars, nobody wins. So the question becomes is what is the unique reason why people need to do business with you? Branding and differentiation apply to things like your website. How are you different on your website? I had somebody comment from another marketing company comment on our, on our marketing website the other day. And, it, and, and he, he said, wow, he said, this is, a, well, it's a, as though he didn't like it, right? And I kind of chuckled. I said, well, if I cared what other marketing people thought, I wouldn't have done it that way. But I don't care to impress you. I'm looking for the customer. It was built for that person. Matter of fact, the marketing company, actually, we, we, we built the website specifically to target those people who are kind of clueless about what they need to do. So it gives them the education. They can actually go through and click on the thing saying, this is what I need. This is what I'm looking for. And, and from there, they can say, I, I need to generate more sales or I need to increase more brand awareness and visibility, right? I, I need to be able to do this. And so from that particular need, it goes through and teaches them about why this stuff is important and how they can do that, right? And, then, and as it's doing that, it's asking them questions about the business, right? And so it's funneling them through, in essence, to a list of strategies that, are, that would be the most beneficial for their business based on what their drive and need are. I don't care that the marketing guy wasn't impressed. But everybody from our target market that's looked at it said, wow, this is awesome. And that's all you care about, right? You think about differentiating yourself. You got to think about things like your fonts. What fonts do you use? What colors? What images do you use? You know, one of the things that I found, especially in marketing, um, is a lot of businesses get stressed out when they think about it, right? So if they get stressed out when they think about it, then, you know, how do we need to relieve that stress? Well, you can give solutions, but... What if we can give humor at the same time? Entertain and educate, right? If we can entertain and educate at the same time it help, to help reduce some of that stress of dealing with this, but also giving them real, real solutions to it, then we can help reduce some of that stress and all that, right? But that's, that's based on that target market. So the question you have to ask yourself is, what does your target market deal with? How do you differentiate yourself with these people? Right. The third thing is getting repeat customers. What I find interesting is that many, many businesses focus on, I need more sales, I need new sales, I need new customers, I need new customers. And what they miss out on is the fact that they have an existing customer base. Now, statistically speaking, it's virtually always cheaper to sell more to an existing customer 
or sell to an existing customer again than it is to acquire a new customer. Cost of acquisition of customers is expensive and it's getting more expensive. And so ultimately what we want to do is we want to attract loyal customers who will buy again and again and again. And so that loyal customer base needs to be nurtured. And oftentimes we forget that. We get so focused on getting in new customers that it's easy to forget, hey, these are, there are people out there that have done business with you in the past. When's the last time they heard from you? How do we advise customers? How do we nurture these relationships? In other words, what a lot of businesses are doing is they end up taking their customers for granted. And so, in my mind, what I want to do is I, I always want to look for ways to treat customers. What can I do for you? How can I help you? How can I take care of you? Right? The fourth item is funding. Challenge. Challenge. Funding marketing efforts. Marketing is not free. I know that there have been books written. Um, Jay Conrad Levinson wrote a book called Guerrilla Marketing, and it's really good. It's how to, how to do some marketing for, for very cheap or free in many cases, and that's good. But you know, in business, there are two things that have a cost, time and money. And so many businesses find that they have the trouble to invest cash in marketing. Matter of fact, I had a conversation with a business yesterday and he said, David, I, you know, I understand the importance of marketing and all that. I just, I don't, I don't have the money to be able to do a lot of this stuff I need to do. I said, well, step into it. He said, what do you mean? I said, well, you know, start out with a very small amount. And then whatever you sell based off of that, then set aside a percentage of the revenue off of that so you can fund back into it. And then as you make more sales, then continue with the same percentage. I said, start with 25% of your revenue from it. And I, I said, from there, I said, then take that 25%, reinvest it back into marketing. And then as you make more sales, keep it going, keep it going, keep it going at 25%. I said, then what happens is when you get to a certain level, you can start decreasing the percentage, right? I said, ideal for most businesses, an ideal marketing budget would be 10% of revenue, right? So if you got $400,000 a year of revenue, you should be spending $40,000 on marketing. Right? As your revenue increases, therefore, if you're using it as a percentage instead of a flat dollar amount, then as your, as your results increase, so do your marketing budget, which will increase your results that much more if you're doing it right. And if you have no cash whatsoever, then start with some, you know, some low-cost methods or some free methods. We actually had somebody the other day that asked us, you know, what could I do for you what, what could I do for you? In essence, it was a barter, right? To, to help me get some marketing for my business until I can get some cash to pay you. Interesting thought process. You know, you, you, a lot of times we don't think about this kind of stuff. You know, a, a, a restaurant, right? Brand new restaurant can't necessarily afford to spend a ton of money on marketing. But... If you can work it out with a marketing company, could you provide some a little bit of free food? I mean, there's cost to that, but there's also always wastage in restaurants, right? We've had that in the past, by the way. We had a, a little buffet restaurant for the longest time. It's like, hey, anytime you want to come eat, come and eat. And this, you don't have to, you know, don't worry about paying for it. Don't worry about anything. Right, great. I have a uh, a maid service that cleans my house and our offices that does the same thing, right? It's a service that I needed. So instead of trading cash, they're trading time and effort, skill sets, those kind of things. So you gotta think about that kind of stuff. Just because you doesn't, don't have cash always, always, always doesn't mean that you can't do anything, right? So, 
And there are lots of cheap ways to do things, things like making videos. I mean, most any phone these days has a, has a good enough quality camera that you can make a good little video that you can post on social media and, and do those, those types of deals, post it on YouTube, tag it and, you know, and, and use it to try to get some organic traffic off those kind of things. Not saying that it'll be the best quality, but it'll do until you can afford more, right? The fifth one we've kind of already addressed a little bit, but it's lack of time. Lack of time. You know, time and money are the two major resources that every, everybody seems to be always trying to balance. And I've said it for years, if you, if you have money but don't have time, then you're going to have to spend money. If you have time but you don't have money, then you're going to have to spend time. Eventually, what will happen is that time will start to make you money. You can start spending some money to free up some time. And that's the beautiful thing is money buys free time. The more money you have, the less time you have to spend doing things yourself. And again, these things can go into many different areas. Writing blog posts, for example. You could spend some time to write some blog posts handling social media pages, posting on Facebook or LinkedIn or Twitter or Instagram or Pinterest or Reddit or whatever it is that may be your where your target market gets to, right? So doing these things. Now, one of the challenges that falls in that is a lot of times business owners, they not only do they not have the time to do those things, they don't have the expertise. Well, if you don't have the time or the expertise, then you're going to have to hire somebody to do it. So I hear all the time people say, well, I've got, I, I've, I've, I've got to do this, but I just don't have the time to do it. Then pay somebody to do it. If you've got money, but not time. I had a, was having a conversation yesterday with a, uh, um, it was a resort. It's a very small resort, right? They've got a, a, they've got a lake and they've got cabins around it and, and this, that, and the other. And one of the things that she was kind of grappling about, they wanted to redo their website, right? And so it's fine. We, you know, the, our marketing company can handle that. And I said, we normally host all of our own websites that we do. It's a 50 bucks a month. And, you know, we do this and this and this and this and this. And she's like, oh, $50 a month. What? Well, we have the baby plan with HostGator currently, and it only costs us $2.87. I said, well, you get what you pay for. You don't pay nothing, so you don't get nothing. You got to do everything yourself. Why are you talking to me? If you actually paid somebody professionally to handle this kind of stuff, then you wouldn't have to be calling and talking to somebody like me and talking about how you need to spend all this money to do it. And by the way, it's $1,500 for us to do that for a basic redesign. It's 1500 bucks. So I said, how many months of uh, 50 bucks a month would that be? A lot. Right, but then by the time all that changes, the technology changes, and you got to spend another fifteen hundred dollars for somebody else to do it. So, I mean, really. But the thing was, was it's not that they have a lack of funding; it's that they have they're so used to not spending virtually anything on it that she's trying to justify the cost of having somebody who can professionally handle things that, that need to be handled. But a lot of that is because she's used to doing it herself. And my answer, my answer to that is, is very simple. It's, you know, there's a reason why your business hasn't grown more than what it has. It's because you're spending so much time working in it and not working on it. If you spent more time working on it, directing the, the people who knew how to handle it, then you would have more time to spend actually doing the things to get people, more people in the door. You're your own problem when it comes to time management. So when it comes, to, especially when it comes to these two things, balance is the key. And that's one of the most difficult challenges. But you can never overlook the value of your time. I find it funny because I get reminded of it on a constant basis. Larry, I'll, I'll go to do something and Larry will, Larry will come up to me and say, whoa, 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 whoa. 
typical Larry style, you know. Whoa, 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 whoa. That's below your pay grade, right? And I'm like, dude, I can make coffee, but I don't. I mean, I, I don't make coffee around the office. It's not that I'm above making coffee or not that I hate making coffee or anything else. It's because Larry focuses on coming in before me and making the coffee so I don't have to do it because he knows the value of my time. Matter of fact, almost every single day I come into the office, there's a fresh cup of coffee sitting on my desk already, right? Because Larry knows the value of my time. And so when you begin as a business owner, one of the things that you tend to do is you tend to underestimate that value of your time. And so you have to look at what's that costing you. Looking at time, in many cases, is cheap. it's cheaper to outsource people to do the things that you want to do instead of trying to do it yourself. It blows my mind at how many entrepreneurs I see out there that are trying to be everything. They're trying to do everything and wear every hat. Completely blows, blows my mind. Because you can't do it. And not only can you not do it, it becomes impossible to scale it. If you're always doing everything yourself, there's no possibility of having more than one bakery, for example. You can't have multiple locations if you're doing everything yourself. Right? So running a business always, always, always comes with certain challenges. And especially for smaller businesses, many of these challenges come in the marketing arena. So one of the things that you should never do is you should never, you should never try, to, try to figure out what is the perfect marketing strategy because that gets you caught up in a cycle of I don't knows. This is, marketing is something that we have to constantly work on and we have to constantly refine. We have to constantly get better at. But, but if you focus in the right places and differentiate yourself well, and you focus on monetizing those repeat customers and you manage your funding well and, and you manage your time well, then marketing won't be an issue. Whatever you can't do that needs to be done, outsource it. Find somebody who's good at it and get them to do it for you. That's how you grow. That's how you overcome that challenge.